Good evening, dear delegates. I take this great deal of pleasure in welcoming all the dear ISAs for National ISA webinar. And the topic for today is ECMO in COVID. I now invite Dr. Naveen Malhotra, Honorary Secretary of ISA National to deliver the welcome address. Over to you, Dr. Naveen Malhotra. Good evening, dear ISAs. Greetings from Indian Society of Anesthesiologists National Headquarters. We all are going through extreme, challenging and hectic circumstances due to the sudden surge of COVID-19 patients in last three weeks. We all are very busy on our toes 24 by 7 in the management of COVID-19 patients in ICUs, SDUs, triage and wards. Some of us have also been infected and some of us family members have also been infected and we have to look after ourselves as well as them also. Still, we all are busy in clinical management of COVID-19 patients throughout the country. I am happy to share with all of you that all of us are working with great zeal, commitment, enthusiasm and sincerity in service of the mankind and humanity during these extreme challenging circumstances of second wave of COVID pandemic. In addition, we are also liaisoning with different government authorities so as to formulate policies to overcome this sudden surge as early as possible, as well as to formulate preventive strategies for the future. Be it be use of 93 plus minus 3% oxygen through oxygen generator plants of the, by the PSA technology, pushing guidelines for the effective use of oxygen different modalities of oxygen therapy, laying stress on minimizing the wastage of the precious oxygen, conducting only emergency and semi-emergency life-saving surgeries and that too under uh, regional anesthesia wherever possible and where G has to be given using low flow anesthesia techniques and the like. All our state and city branches of ISA across the country are also working 24 by 7, so that each and individual member is helped in the need of R. COVID-19 helpline numbers for anesthesiologists is on ISA website and has been circulated by email and WhatsApp also, so that any anesthesiologist, when he or she needs any help, he or she knows whom to contact, where to contact. ISA has principally decided to limit the number of webinars during the current scenario so that we the anesthesiologist can focus on clinical work. But today's webinar is important because it focuses on a very specialized topic of ICMO in COVID. ICMO is available at limited centers. This is known and it has got fixed indications. So I'm sure the delegates who are attending today's webinar will be benefited by the experience of the anesthesiologists who have been doing ICMO during the last one year. I once again pray and hope that this pandemic, this peak is over soon. All your family members, friends and you yourself are safe and healthy. Indian Society of Anesthesiologists, the national body, state body and the city body are always with its member 24 by 7 for any kind of help all your suggestions are most, most welcome. I pray that all of you survive this particular pandemic, the wave and work safely so that you are there to serve the mankind, your own family members, parents, kids and the like. Long live ISA, Jai ICN, Jai Hind. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Naveen Malhotra. Now I request Dr. Yes Balabaskar, the chairman of ISA Academic Committee to deliver his address. Good evening. Uh, on behalf of the Academic Committee of ISA National, I'm very happy to note that uh, a special type of program is being uh, um, projected by ISA National today. This is about the role of ECMO in COVID. And uh, the other most important thing today is uh, the, the, the 
all of the participants here are our own colleagues, anesthesiologists who are very successful and popular intensivists and who are specialists in ECMO also. So they are the ones who are going to share their knowledge during the COVID times last year and up till this point of time this year also. So we have got uh, Dr. Vivek Gupta, Dr. Arpan Chakravarti, Dr. Muli Krishna, Dr. V. Arun, and of course, we have Suresh Rao, who is going to moderate a panel discussion at the end also. So this is great news for ISA, great news for intensivists during the COVID times across India. I thank all the parties, the, the, the faculty who are giving uh, their precious time and sharing the knowledge today. And uh, I wish the program all the senses. Thank you very much. Long live ISA. Thank you, Dr. Yes Balabaskar. Now I request our president, Dr. Molida Joshi to deliver presidential speech. Good evening, everyone. Respected Vice President of Suresh Bhargava, President Lak Dr. Abhinkar Giri, Chairman Academic Committee, Dr. Balabaskar, Honorary Secretary, Dr. Noel Malhotra, Honorary Treasurer, Dr. Virendra Sharma, Editor in Chief, Dr. Lid Mehdiratta, and all the GC members of ISA National, faculty, and delegates. It gives me an immense pleasure to share with you the kind of topic that has been chosen for uh, today's webinar, that is ECMO and COVID, is wrapped very much, especially during the second wave, where we are losing people in large numbers. Yes, we know uh, we don't have uh, this kind of facility at many places across the country. And even the knowledge about ECMO itself, in few, very few, uh, very few people know about that one. But having said that, knowledge has uh, no barriers or no boundaries. Nothing wrong knowing about a new technique or maybe a new procedure which might uh, help the patients. And the kind of uh, topics which are chosen, like what the indication for ECMO, the challenges, can be bridge between regular ventilation and the lung transplant, so on and so forth. Of course, everybody wants to have an idea what is the new thing that's happening and with that it can be offered to patients to the centers wherever in the patient or the right kind of patient is available. In this context, I think uh, we should appreciate the webinar coordinator, Dr. Arpan Chakrabarti, for putting all his personal efforts in getting everybody on the board and getting it recorded and for all the discussion. And it's a nice feeling that I know, though, of course, testing time for all of us, but we had to keep trying to uh, overcome this pandemic with uh, what are available tools are there. In this context, today's webinar, Standard, standard uh, event, I would like to say. I wish the faculty a great success, and I'm sure it's going to be one of the best programs ever conducted by ISA team. And uh, you congratulate the uh, webinar coordinator, Dr. Arvind Chakravarti. Long live ISA. Jai Hind. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Murlidhar Joshi. Now let's welcome our first speaker, Dr. Vivek Gupta, who will be delivering the speech on how ECMO helps in severe COVID conditions. Over to you, Dr. Vivek Gupta. Good evening, everybody. First of all, I'm thankful to organizers who gave me this opportunity to speak on such an important topic in the present scenario, how ECMO helps in severe COVID infections. We are well aware that the initial presenting symptoms of the COVID-19 patients is the fever, cough, fatigue, uh, loss of taste and uh, loss of uh, uh, smell, anorexia, myalgia, and sometimes diarrhea. Usually by the seventh day, the severity increases and the first initial symptom is the dyspnea in, the, in almost 40% of patients and they develop hypoxemia as well. And gradually these uh, start worsening and uh, nearly 14% patients, they develop the severe illness. And almost 5% patients, they become critically ill with the involvement of maybe other organs in some subset of the patients, including the cardiac, renal, or other organs as well. They can present with the arrhythmias, they can have the cardiogenic shock, and uh, uh, then uh, they further worsen because of the multi-organ failure and various infections. So if we talk about the pathophysiology of the hypoxia, how it happens in the COVID-19 patient. Basically, initially in the initial phases, there is a 
uh, intrapulmonary shunting because of fatty lactosis. So there is a ventilation perfusion mismatch, which is added by the development of interstitial edema. The another important mechanism in the COVID-19 patient is the intra, uh, development of intravascular microthromboemboli. And that further worsen the gas exchange in the lungs. And there is a loss of lung perfusion and um, hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. All these contributes in the worsening of the hypoxia. And once the condition further worsens, there will be reduction in the lung compliance and further dead space ventilation will take place and increasing consolidation and increasing uh, atelectasis that further worsen hypoxemia and there'll be a CO2 retention. And gradually, the increase, there's increased work of breathing and ultimately uh, these uh, patients land up with the mechanical vent, uh, ventilatory support. So if we look at the uh, escalation of the therapies in patients who are severely ill, we initiate with the oxygen therapy with the various modalities, including the nasal prong mask or non-rebreathing mask, high flow nasal cannula or sometimes non-invasive ventilation. But we should target an early intubation in these patients if they are not uh, maintaining adequate oxygenation and their FI2 requirement is very high. And sometimes, even after intubation, they do not maintain oxygen saturation. We need to keep them sedated and use the muscle relaxant to paralyze them, um, along with the proning at all level for these patients to improve the oxygenation. And if nothing works, then possibly there is a role of ECMO to support oxygenation and gas exchange in these patients. Uh, the ventilatory management, we are well, well aware that we follow the AIDS protocol. We target a tidal volume of six to eight millimeter, uh, milli, milliliter per, per kilogram of predicted body weight. However, we target a plateau pressure less than 30. If the plateau pressure goes up, we further try to reduce the tidal volume to uh, as low as four ml per kilogram of predicted weight. We use the PEEP for prevention of uh, lung de-recruitment, and we try to restrict the uh, ventilator-induced lung injury. In certain cases, we allow a higher plateau pressure uh, in patients who are obese or who are having a reduced lung compliance. But so, uh, in most of these patients, the oxygenation is always compromised and we struggle with the mechanical ventilatory support. And when we are ventilating these patients and they are developing severe hypoxemia and they are not being maintained, we keep increasing the PEEP, we keep increasing the ventilatory support. So this leads to multiple problems, including hypercapnia, because we keep increasing the PEEP, we restrict the plateau pressure, and up to a certain extent, we can increase the respiratory rate uh, to wash out the carbon dioxide, but we have to accept certain higher carbon dioxide level um, as a permissive hypercapnia. Um, again, we can cause the ventilator-induced lung injury in the form of uh, volutrauma, where there is a over distension of the alveoli, or uh, barotrauma, where there's a direct pressure injury to the lung, or there can be a biotrauma with the uh, multiple uh, mediators, interleukins, and other mediators which can do the direct lung injury are with a high oxygen concentration also, we can uh, cause the uh, lung injury. Then these patients, they become hypoproteinemic. We keep pushing their fluid and ultimately because of fluid shift, they develop uh, pleural effusion. There can be development of pneumothorax. And for a prolonged ventilated patient, ultimately the lung parenchyma there is in the lung parenchyma, there's a fibroproliferative uh, changes and ultimately it leads to a permanent lung injury. When we try to ventilate these patients at a higher ventilatory setting, there is a chance of hemodynamic instability because uh, the, the right side of the heart is pressed uh, because of increased uh, intrathoracic pressure. And this leads to a reduction in the venous uh, return and ultimately cardiac output and uh, drop in the blood pressure. We keep pushing uh, fluids and uh, we keep vasopressors to maintain the hemodynamics and ultimately it leads to uh, fluid retention and renal dysfunction and ultimately because of compromised uh, renal perfusion because of hemodynamic instability. And gradually these patients develop sepsis and multi-organ involvement. 
and gradually uh, the, we see the downhill course in these patients. RV dysfunction, another issue uh, which can happen, especially in these COVID patients because of multiple reasons, including the uh, micro thromboembolic events. So our recent experience in the last 10 to 15 years um, uh, related with the ECMO has given a thought to start ECMO in these patients to manage ARDS in these uh, uh, um, COVID-19 patients. So the first trial, uh, the CESAR trial, which is a very popular trial, actually when the, we restarted using ECMO in the intensive care unit, before that, the ECMO was restricted to certain specialized unit. So it was the H1N1 pandemic in 2009 when the Australian group and along with the CESAR trial was done and they showed a good survival with the um, of those patients who were supported with the ECMO. Further, during a H1N1, uh, another uh, prospective cohort study was done in 2011, again, which has shown improved survival. Uh, and uh, then in 2018, EULA trial, and during the MERS uh, corona uh, infection in the 2018, again, the group showed an improved survival and lower mortality in a patient who had a refractory hypoxia. So this um, success of the VV ECMO in these ARDS patients, uh, we try to replicate uh, in the patients who developed severe ARDS with the COVID-19. So what exactly is that? It is basically a form of extracorporeal life support where we are having an external artificial circuit through which the blood is taken from the patient with the help of white bore cannula. Uh, the venous blood is taken from the patient. Then outside the body, it is being oxygenated with the help of an oxygenator. And with the help of pump, it is being pushed back uh, either to the central vein, we call it as VV ECMO, or to a central artery, then we call it as VA. So if we broadly understand, it is a modified form of cardiopulmonary bypass, but it has a multiple differences as compared to the cardiopulmonary bypass that we need lesser uh, anticoagulation in these because we don't have a reservoir, we don't use reservoir in this. And uh, the oxygenator is a long lasting, it can go for weeks uh, to give support to the patient. But we should remember, that it is a temporary support, which can be a prolonged one, but it is always a temporary support, which can serve, uh, help the cardiovascular system. It can help to the respiratory system um, as in the form of V ECMO or VV ECMO, but secondarily it helps the other system as well because we maintain the oxygenation, tissue oxygenation, or we maintain the perfusion and thus prevent the injury to the other organ as well. So how does it benefits? Basically, if we talk about the ARDS, what we do, we keep pushing the pressures on the failing lung. Try just, we just try to maintain some numbers or an SpO2. To maintain certain numbers, we keep pushing a high peak, we increase the FiO2, we keep increasing the peak pressure and plateau pressure, and that further damages the lung. Similarly, for any patient who is having cardiogenic shock, we try to maintain the hemodynamics with the help of vasopressors or anotropic support. But ECMO helps by reduce, giving the rest to that particular organ. If we talk about the lungs, it takes over the work of the lung, or if we talk about the heart, it supports the heart, it reduces the uh, workload on the heart, and thus give rest to the affected organ. But we should remember that ECMO is a bridge. It is not a treatment. It is just a bridge where we expect the recovery of the uh, organ which is compromised or we, it can be a bridge to another bridge like uh, LVADs for the cardiac or um, other lung assist devices or it can be a bridge to a transplant for heart lung or heart lung transplant or we should be aware, especially in the COVID situation, there can be a situation bridge to nowhere because if the lung is not recovering, our patient is developing some intracranial hemorrhage 
our uh, patient is having a, some neurological insult or some other complication, then possibly it should be a bridge to nowhere. So it is very important that before initiating ECMO, we must discuss all these possibilities to the patient relative. So what are the indications uh, of ECMO in the COVID-19 patient? Basically, severe ARDS with a PaO2 FiO2 ratio less than 100, but in fact, what patient comes to us is most of the time they have the PaO2 FiO2 ratio less than 50, even, with they are needing a high uh, PEEP along with the high oxygen concentration. And if we uh, go with the objective criteria, then the Murray score should be more than three. Or it can be useful in cases of pulmonary embolism, where both VV ECMO and V ECMO can be beneficial. VV ECMO, if patient is only having a refractory hypoxemia, or if the patient is having a massive pulmonary embolism with a cardiovascular collapse, then VV ECMO is a, a treatment option. Another subset of the patient, what we are seeing with the COVID-19 patient uh, who are critically ill, they have the refractory myocardial failure. So if there is inadequate, inadequate tissue perfusion, your metabolic uh, parameters are worsening, like the rising lactates and uh, worsening the uh, bicarbonate level, our patient is having a severe myocarditis with ejection fraction less than 35%. Our patient is having acute, card, uh, acute coronary syndrome with the cardiogenic shock. These all can be a candidate for uh, support with the VA. But this is just a guideline. Every ECMO center should develop their own center-specific inclusion and ex exclusion criteria, and it should be done on the case-to-case -case basis because this is a resource-intensive procedure, and we are having uh, many patients who may need the support, and probably there will be a um, the disrupt. Uh, there may, uh, may be a discrepancy in the chain uh, and supply system. So, if we quickly see at the Mure score, it considers a PO2 FiO2 ratio, chest X-ray to look at the consolidation that how many quadrants are involved looks at the PEEP, what PEEP support has been given, and what is the compliance. And by looking at, if it is above 2.5, this is considered as a severe lung injury. So any patient who is health, coming in the category of 3 or 4 should be considered for ECMO. But before starting ECMO or before thinking of ECMO, we should always rule out all contraindication. So, so the absolute contraindication include an advanced age, are the priorities scale more than 3, our patient is having end-stage malignancy or severe neurological damage or intracranial hemorrhage, or there is a contraindication to the anticoagulation, or there is an order for do not resuscitate. There are certain relative contraindication where you can opt, you can choose therapy on case-to-case -case basis if the age is more than 65 or patient is morbidly obese or having multiple comorbid conditions, but they are stable or controlled. Our patient is having septic shock in those conditions if you feel that the chance of survival is good, then these patients may be considered for ECMO support. So it is important during this COVID time that we should triage these patient, um, uh, patients who are requiring ECMO. So patients should be sorted, classified, and defined that who should be benefited with the help of ECMO. So how these patients are selected, this is very, very important, that we follow certain criteria. So these patients, if they are younger, there is a more chance of their survival. Those patients who are having a single organ dysfunction, they can be uh, benefited more with the ECMO support, or if they are not having any comorbidity, or if we expect that the duration of ECMO is shorter, or there is a more chances of survival in this patient. Certain secondary criteria should also be taken in consideration, like, uh, if we expect that the duration and quality of life is going to be long, then definitely he can be a candidate for ECMO support. So the different type of ECMO support which we can offer to these patients, it can be a VV ECMO, veno venous for ARDS patients for supporting the respiratory system. So if we are talking about a VV ECMO, we can use the different um, access and return uh, for the giving the oxygenated blood. So it can be accessed from femoral vein and the return can be to the jugular vein, which you can see in this upper picture that this is the access cannula. A white board cannula has been placed in the left femoral vein. And now after oxygenation, it, it is being returned back 
with the right internal jugular vein. So this is one combination, femoral and uh, jugular. Another combination which is uh, being used during this COVID time, especially femoral, fem femoral vein, when both the femoral veins are being uh, chosen for uh, access and return uh, both cannula. So, but one should be very, very careful when we are using these uh, femoro-femoral root because there is a more risk of uh, recirculation. The another uh, support VA ECMO when we are want to support both heart and lung. That's a veno arterial ECMO. In this lower diagram, you can see the both femoral artery and femoral vein has been chosen. You can see this is the percutaneous scalation of this femoral artery, and this is the femoral vein. And you can see a third sheet, uh, six French sheet, um, which is for the distal perfusion to prevent any distal limb ischemia. Then, if we have a mixed kinds of pathology, like both ARDS with the myocardial dysfunction, in those situations, we can opt for VAV ECMO or VV ECMO, depending on the condition of the patient. So this is the most common combination which we are using during this uh, AIDS patients in COVID. This, you can see this is the femoral vein. We are taking blood from the femoral vein with the help of pump head. We are pushing this through an oxygenator which is taking where the gas exchange is taking place with the, uh, with the help of this oxygen blender. And then the oxygenated blood is being pushed back to the right atrium and this is being circulated to the body. And thus we are maintaining the oxygenation as well as we are able to remove carbon dioxide from the um, uh, body while maintaining the mechanical ventilation at a uh, lung protective strategy. So what are the different options we have? When there is an isolated respiratory failure, VV ECMO with the use of peripheral percutaneous cannulation. Um, if you feel that there is a risk of exposure to limit it, we can go for the bifemoral strategy, but one should be very, very careful about recirculation. Then if suppose patient is having a right ventricular dysfunction, then in that situation, a VV echo plus RVET support with the use of Mpela can be used. If the patient is having a cardiac issues along with the respiratory or isolated cardiac issue, in those conditions, we can support using the uh, VA echo. And if patient is having a respiratory um, um, involvement, with the form of ARDS. So sometime we may need to add a venous cannula with this to prevent any upper body uh, deoxygenation if the VECMO is supporting the heart, but lungs are also bad and heart has started improving. So that's called as Harlequin syndrome or North South syndrome. When there is a differential hypoxia, the upper body is not getting oxygenated. So there is a risk of coronary ischemia and cerebral ischemia. So in those conditions, probably besides taking other measures related with the ventilation and flow, we can always add another cannula to improve the oxygenation. That's called as VAV ECMO. So how we manage these patients who are on ECMO? The first thing when we are managing these AIDS patients, immediately the lung protective ventilation should be initiated after initiation of ECMO and stabilizing, stabilizing the patient. So we should follow the rule of 10 where we are keeping the PEEP of 10 and respiratory rate of 10. And we are keeping limiting the uh, peak pressure less than 25 to prevent any further lung injury. And in the early phases, we need to give sedation and muscle relaxing so that patient doesn't fight and further uh, injure the lung. Besides this, anticoagulation management should be robust with the help of heparin, if there is no contraindication for heparin, but if there is a heparin-induced thrombocytopenia or there is a, another other contraindication, probably other uh, anticoagulants in the form of bivalyridine or other anticoagulant can be used. We follow an early tracheostomy because uh, that will help us in during the weaning as well as will allow us the tracheal tonality and patient mobilization will be better. We try to ventilate, uh, wean these patients uh, we try to uh, wean ECMO first, but sometimes when a patient is dependent on ECMO, we may need uh, to uh, wean them from ventilation as well. And early mobilization in these patients is very important um, uh, from a psychological point of view, as well as for improving the lung functions. We 
encouraged to have a maintain the nutrition with the enteral root uh, as early as possible in these patients. Preferably, it was an enteral root, and we try to prevent and manage the sepsis. Identify, try to identify sepsis early because it is difficult to identify sepsis early in these uh, ECMO patients because they can have a drop in platelets because of uh, ECMO circuited cell or because temperature is being regulated. So they may not have the high grade fevers or counts can be increased because of multiple reasons. So any suspicion, the sepsis should be evaluated and addressed very quick. We monitor the other organ functions um, uh, like uh, renal functions or liver functions, and we keep assess neurologically these patients regularly because patients is on anticoagulant and there is always a risk of intracranial hemorrhage. And we keep monitoring regularly the efficacy, safety, and efficiency of the ECMO system because the ECMO is integrated with the patient. So we keep checking the ECMO circuits, oxygenator, as well as we do certain blood tests to ensure that the safety of ECMO, uh, like it is not causing any hemolysis or it is not uh, leading any complications. So we always look for the efficacy, safety, and efficiency of ECMO. So in the short time of almost one year, uh, nearly one year of uh, this COVID pandemic, um, there are certain publications which have shown a promising result, though the initial publication uh, were very discouraging with a very high mortality. But this is a study from US, from the multi-center cohort of the 5,122 5, patients, uh, where 190 patients were treated with ECMO in ICU, who were admitted in ICU within 14 uh, days of ICU admission, they were treated with ECMO. And they had shown a good results and author concluded that uh, if the ECMO was initiated in the first seven days of ICU admission, there was lower mortality. Um, also, the Extracorporeal Life Support Organization has also published uh, this in the JAMA, uh, the initial results, and they uh, concluded that the discharge was less than 40%, but the recent ELSO data dashboard shows uh, nearly 6,406 COVID suspected or confirmed patients uh, and in hospital mortality of 49%. But if we further uh, look at this data, this discharge from the hospital is actually uh, much lower than this, nearly around uh, 40%, because the discharge to the other long-term acute care or unspecified or to the other hospital has also been included uh, in these uh, category of discharge. Uh, but it's still, because we do not have other hope for maintaining oxygenation, and gradually we are learning and we are uh, getting more wiser with the use of ECMO. So um, survival can be expected to be better in the future uh, ECMO cases. So if you look at the algorithm, if a patient is COVID-19 positive and he's requiring mechanical ventilation, we look at FiO2 ratio if it is less than 150 or whether it's a more than 150. If it is more than 150, we look at pH and PCO2. If it is pH is low or PCO2 is high, above 80, then we look for any contraindication for ECMO. If this is lower than this, we could just continue with the current management. If the PO2 FiO2 ratio is less than 150, uh, we try for proning, we increase the PEEP, we use the neuromuscular blockade, uh, so that uh, we can uh, ventilate the patient well, or we use the pulmonary vasodilator. If in spite of this patient is not improving, we look for any contraindication of that. Then we assess this patient if there is any cardiogenic shock. If the, there is no cardiogenic shock, we can go for VV ECMO. But if there is a cardiogenic shock, uh, we can go for V ECMO. Uh, and at any point of time, if you feel that there is a cytokine storm, a cytokine filter can always be added to the ECMO circuit. In the last, but a very, very important aspect that one should protect uh, you, uh, yourself, your patient, as well as your colleagues or any staff working um, in the ECMO unit. One should be very clear that how to don and doff and appropriately doffing should always be done. And there should be appropriate teamwork ensuring that only few people who are required should be inside the room 
and the, all the supply should be given from outside the room by other people so that the risk of infection can be minimized. So to conclude, ECMO is a resource intensive therapy that can be considered only in the highly selected patient because in this time, we have a more number of patient and less number of uh, ECMO support systems. So we should choose the patient judiciously. Every treatment should be evidence-based in the ARDS management as per the algorithm, and a multidisciplinary approach should be followed for recommending any patient for ECMO if there is a failure of conventional therapy. One should choose the therapy appropriately if a patient is having purely ARDS, VV ECMO is an um, option, but if the patient is having a myocardial dysfunction as well, then possibly a VA ECMO uh, is an option, but a vigilant monitoring is important at any point of time. If there is a further worsening of the cardiac or respiratory function, we have to convert this to the mixed ECMO combination. And ECMO should be offered to those who have the highest chance of survival and early institution of ECMO has associated with the better outcome. Appropriate infection control precautions should be taken for the safety of the uh, healthcare workers. And we should always remember that ECMO is a bridge. It is not a definitive therapy. So a destination should be defined before initiation of ECMO and a thorough patient selection by ruling out the contraindications should be done. And the relatives must be discussed about a situation when um, continuing ECMO therapy may be futile in certain cases and they should be ready to, they should be counseled to withdraw the ECMO support in those situations. Thank you very much. If you have any question, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you, Dr. Vivek Gupta. Now let's welcome our second speaker, Dr. Arpan Chakrabarti, who will be speaking about challenges in COVID ECMO. Over to you, Dr. Arpan Chakrabarti. Hi, everybody. Myself, Dr. Arpan Chakrabarti, and uh, I am going to uh, speak on awake ECMO. I have no financial interest, but I am only interested in uh, ECMO awareness. Uh, this is a, a newspaper cutting which showed uh, in uh, around August that 43% of our COVID-19 deaths happened in India is between the 30 to 59 years of age. So if we, if we take, uh, these are the patients, most of the patients, this age group will require uh, an ECMO support at the point of their acute respiratory failure or acute uh, cardiopulmonary failure. And they have to come to their professional life. They have to come back to their um, uh, bread and uh, role of the family. At that point of time, they need a very good uh, physiotherapy, a, a very good uh, neuromuscular recovery at the earliest to come back to their uh, professional daily regular activities. So after keeping this uh, thing in mind, uh, why, what is awake ECMO and when we practice it? So three kind of uh, uh, scenarios where we practice uh, uh, in uh, awake ECMO, like in VV ECMO. May, in VV ECMO, if I want the patient to be awake, that means I want to get rid of the ventilation, the ill effects of the ventilation, the VAP, the, uh, the lung atelectasis, the secretions, so that, that we want to get rid of. Obviously, if the patient is getting awake and he's recovering and he is uh, taking part of this awake exercises, physiotherapies, so his recovery, neuromuscular recovery will be good. So that is another motto. And the third one is that if we are waiting for a organ, for a lung, and the patient is on VV ECMO, so we have to keep him uh, very fit, neuromuscular uh, uh, weakness should not be there, and he should be as normal as a patient, except his uh, lung point of view. So bridge to transplant on VV ECMO has to be kept awake and communicating with the family and take full physical exercises. Next is VA ECMO. Uh, 
the main indications of avec ECMO in VA is uh, breach to transplant or breach to BAD. We'll come to later on few publications where uh, they have showed that uh, AVEC VA ECMO are doing better when they are transplanted or bad. And in acute VA ECMOs, we tend to keep them awake because a patient is awake means they're the best cerebral monitor. The awake patient, cerebrally active, he can move all his four limbs and uh, he is uh, he is taking part of your communication is the best patient where you can monitor regular basis you can monitor the harlequin on awake patient you can see the limb status any any uh, uh, distal digital limb ischemia distal limb ischemia happening or not they will immediately complain of pain they will immediately complain of your food drop and all this so on va ECMO, mostly we keep them awake we keep them bit of ambulatory we keep uh, 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 try to keep them uh, this neuro, neuromuscular active just to go for it if they going for a transplant or bad because of their good uh, outcome and uh, in uh, cerebral and limb status should be known. Third one is the most important part of this uh, uh, Sometimes is e cord extracorporeal uh, CO2 retention, uh, this uh, <coughs> extracorporeal CO2 removal patients. We don't want to intubate them. In particular, in COPD patients, we act ECOR as a respiratory dialysis so that we can avoid the ill effects of ventilation. Only the hypercapnia part is taking care, taken care of by ECOR. So these are the conditions, these are the indications where we actually uh, need a good awake ECMO uh, to practice. Now, what are the actual advantages when the patient is awake? Or spontaneously breathing. Mostly the advantages are from the respiratory part of the view because if you see we do preferentially uh, uh, ventilate or the more compliant part of the diaphragm and causing good uh, VQ matching. Very less VQ mismatch happens when you are awake spontaneously breathing. Our tone of the respiratory muscles get intact and thus we improve our uh, functional real cap uh, capacity, FRC. Obviously, we, uh, there is a decrease of the diaphragmatic dysfunction because of ventilator-induced diaphragmatic dysfunction or sedation-induced or paralysis-induced diaph diaphragmatic dysfunction. The spontaneous breathing improves venous return. So maintain the carbon uh, this uh, mm, cardiac output by, by that. And obviously, always an awake patient is always a lesser chance of VAP uh, than your sedated patients. So this is very good, well uh, depicted by uh, the T. Langer in Critical Care 2016. And if you see this uh, picture, that when you are awake, spontaneously breathing, and when you are in mechanical ventilation, your area of ventilation goes a bit up in the spontaneous breathing where is actually there is a good amount of VQ is happening. Then your mechanical ventilation, which is on the dependent part of the diaphragm and you have a very low VQ. So on the uh, rule, these mechanical ventilated patients are at high risk of VQ mismatch than the spontaneous breathing patient. But there are problems of spontaneous breathing on ECMO, on ARDS patients, like these three are the important parts. You can, uh, if, if you are keeping the patient awake, you can uh, render him for a spontaneous induced lung injury. He had, if he is tachypneic, he had, can have this high work of breathing or, and there are a lot of troubleshootings like cannula dislodgement, uh, like uh, equipment failure, the change of cannula position, uh, removal, anything can happen. So all the troubleshooting you have to take care of. So these three are the main problems when the, we are practicing the AVEC ECMO. Now, when the patients, uh, uh, you are practicing the patients on AVEC ECMO, what is your uh, thing? The respiratory rate should be measured. Not only the respiratory rate, have there any dyspnea, the respiratory rate goes up with rapid shallow breathing, or he had some, he or she had some paradoxical breathing, 
or he had. That is a, a very good paper, again, by T. Langer, which shows there's a very, if you measure your esophageal pressure, there is a big swing which is happening. Uh, if it is more than 15 centimeter water, you need a deep sedation and switch to the conventional invasive ventilation if you are practicing awake ECMO. So with this idea, if I see this, what should be our caution when you are practicing patients on air? Look at the uh, lady, this is uh, the early part of the ECMO. I'm trying to get her by showing her, uh, telling her to show the tongue, but she is not coherent. Her uh, response is not uh, uh, very much coherent uh, uh, or accustomed with me. And on the top of that, what is happening? She's not uh, uh, cooperating with us. And there is a rigorous cuffing on your uh, uh, ventilator tube. So this can cause a good amount of lung injury, sometimes pneumothorax. You have to be very cautious when this kind of uh, the early part of the awakening. So you have to be very cautious about that. Number two, this patient, if you see, I get her away, she's fine, but she's very much tachypneic. Look at the uh, respiratory rate on the ventilator and look at her breathing. She is having a paradoxical breathing, shallow breathing on ventilator, and I'm keeping her away. So we should not keep her fully away with this kind of uh, uh, ventilatory uh, or this kind of respiratory uh, pattern because there is a chance of increased collapse during this. So obviously also uh, uh, recommend some extubation criteria as assessing the readiness for this. Obviously you should not have any multi-organ failure, but you should be awake and cooperative enough. There should not be any secretions. And there are some gas exchange goals, which tells us if you point, if I have to a 0.4 with a PEEP of five, you should maintain a PO2 more than 80. And Extubation, obviously, you need to have just physio suctioning, prepare supplemental oxygen, consider extubating on rebreathing mass or HSMC, and always uh, keep emergency into intubation ready for your if it fails. And that's a very good article by my friend Jumana uh, uh, with in uh, this IJCTS TCS 2021. What will uh, how you will plan your physiotherapy when in deep sedation, in mild to moderate sedation, in awake patients? If the patient in deep sedation, you have to go for a mainly passive postural exercises, the limb exercises. Mild to moderate sedation, according to the muscle power, you will, you will uh, give some amount of exercises like uh, uh, passive muscle movements and active muscle movements with the grade of the muscle power. And if they are awake, you can go for a neck and trunk control. You can age of the go for age of the bed sitting. You can go for kinetic exercises. Then you go for some standing or chair sitting. You can do this is a very good article which can be uh, uh, for good references. Now, what are the potential dangers when you, in, in every patient on ECMO, you try to mobilize? There are three uh, main points. Is if he had during uh, mobilization had a hemodynamic instability. He had desaturation, he had a chance of fall. You go back to your previous position. These three you have to fix. Dislodgement of cannulas, you have to fix before uh, um, uh, mobilization. Dragging of the cannula and circuit can happen. You have to fix it. And painkillers you have to give before any mobilization. And machine malfunction. So you have to run your checklist before that. Now, if there are a few articles which uh, uh, publish uh, published very in a very for last uh, uh, eight to ten years, which showed a like uh, this article from China. We uh, they uh, found a, if twelve cases awake ECMO they performed without ventilation, continuous ventilation, and uh, twenty eight cases of uh, ventilation on ECMO, they found the outcome is better when not ventilating. Obviously, and this is a very good article by the Kiran Shekhar uh, at all. Uh, showed a very, it can be practiced. Awake ECMO is a very good practice, uh, can be practiced in severe respiratory failure uh, patients of who are immunocompromised, like in pneumocystis carini pneumonias. And this is a very good article which uh, uh, published in uh, this thing, uh, Journal of Heart Lung Transplant. Uh, this awake extracorporeal membrane oxygenation as bridge to lung transplant. 
and there uh, uh, they found that the, their outcome is as comparable as on no uh, ECMO and mechanical ventilation and in ECMO patients lab than your uh, mechanical ventilation and ECMO patients. So awake ECMO is preferred when the patient is going for a lung transplant. And this is another thing uh, in, from Hanover, Germany, where they have uh, specific indications for IVG ECMO when they're going for transplant, right, right ventricular failure, refractory to intravenous prostocycline, profound hypoxemia with prolonged and continuous arterial oxygen saturation less than 80%, and refractory hypercapnia and respiratory acidosis. So these three are the indications when they put uh, the patients on IVG ECMO before transplant. And obviously, their results are better when the patients are on awake ECMO for the lung, they're going for the lung transplant than the intubated uh, patient going for the lung transplant. Now, and this is a very really, uh, good article where ECOR uh, is, has been super, uh, uh, awake ECOR is super intubation in near fetal asthma attacks. So they avoided intubations by uh, giving ECOR uh, as a therapy for the hypercapnia in asthma and avoided intubation by this. And this is our Dr. Mani, R.K. Mani's article, which uh, showed where uh, they have avoided uh, uh, intubation in acute exacerbation COPD in older patients by giving a respiratory dialysis or awake ECOR. So awake ECMO is, uh, is very much beneficial. And this is another uh, ambulatory venovatous ECMO oxygenation, which, which is applicable to your primary uh, graft dysfunction after post-lung transplant. So they avoided my uh, mechanical ventilation uh, uh, by doing awake ECMO. Coming to this, uh, and how you do this, uh, this is a very oral feeling when the patients are getting awake and you uh, uh, make them feed on ECMO and they're taking uh, well. So you have to be very cautious about this, but this is very, uh, you can practice it like this if they are participating in your, with your feeding. This is your next thing. How do we perform uh, on regularly? Uh, we do perform spirometry on ECMO like this. This patient is on ECMO is uh, uh, without still now on day uh, 19 of this and the air leak, severe air leak syndrome. He is on uh, uh, femoro-femoral uh, VV ECMO, but doing good physiotherapy. I think uh, uh, some lung improvement we can see in a couple of days. If you see how do we mobilize uh, the patients on ECMO, we can mobilize them. This patient also uh, via uh, femoral femoral venovenous ECMO, and we mobilize at the edge of the bed. And we are trying to uh, get physiotherapy. He's trying to get uh, uh, his hand elevated, and uh, somebody is uh, pressing on his back so that the, uh, uh, his front control should come. And this is the way we do mobilize uh, the patients on ECMO. You have to see the, uh, uh, this flow is adequate and uh, uh, the color is adequate during your uh, mobilization also. So how the, uh, these are the uh, patients, how do we uh, mobilize them? Like at first at the age of the bed, if they tolerate it uh, well, then we put them on the chair, which can be uh, uh, through which you can uh, make them bit uh, uh, to come to uh, the outside of the ICU. You can show the sunlight, and they are doing better. When, uh, so this is the plan of your mobilization of ECMO, uh, graded mobilization slowly on uh, uh, these respiratory ECMO patients, and uh, how uh, uh, that is how uh, our physiotherapist is uh, making these limb exercises after uh, putting him on chair. Um, uh, this is also a femoral femoral lake move, which, um, which is better for our daily exercises. Obviously, physiotherapy and ECMO uh, is very important. Uh, uh, with awake ECMO, you have to give, if you want to give a good um, uh, benefit of awake ECMO, you have to go to a good physiotherapy, like uh, reduction of VAP, like a sputum clearance, improved lung compliance, and uh, thereby reducing atelectasis and rehabilitations. Uh, more the awake, more mobilized, uh, there is a ch less chance of bed sore. They are a good neuromuscular recovery. And obviously, they got psychological boosting. They come out early and they uh, do early uh, recovery. So and if you found, uh, this is the patient, uh, which is uh, 48 days of ECMO. She is a dentist, pediatric dentist. And uh, she came out of 48 days of ECMO. And post discharge 15, she, she sent me this uh, video. And she is completely doing fine. 
uh, we kept uh, uh, practice awake it more uh, from uh, the second week. She received a lot of proning and all this. Though after good uh, exercises, after doing good physiotherapy uh, during it more, she recovered well and look at her uh, day 15 uh, activity. So this is your result of awake ECMO. And obviously you need a good team to perform awake ECMO. Thank you. If any questions, I'm happy to answer. Thank you, Dr. Arpan Chakravarti. Now let's welcome our third speaker, Dr. Murli Krishnati, who will be talking about COVID ECMO, bridge to recovery, transplant or nowhere. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Murli Krishna. I work as a senior consultant at MJ Healthcare. Over the next 20 minutes, I'll briefly report uh, in a COVID ECMO patient, what if it is a bridge to recovery, how to go for it, uh, if it is a case for transplant, how to go for it, and what we land up in a situation where we're not able to do anything. First of all, before going to the talk, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity. So this is the brief overview of how we are going to look at this topic. To start with, as a bridge to recovery, um, this is the data from the ELSO, which they have pulled for more than 2,500 patients. As we have seen clearly, ECMO has uh, shown a benefit or it can make a survival difference in someone who is very badly affected with the COVID. Close to 40 to 50 percent of these patients will survive. But again, as you have seen in the same chart on the x-axis, what is more important is you may need to support these patients for a longer time. A lot of them needs more than one month of support and that support period may extend up to two to three months also. And similarly, a lot of them needs a good rehabilitatory support in some form or other once you take them off the ECMO. So these two are very important when you're talking of the COVID ECMO in these cases. So uh, we, the, we try to pull the data and see which factors are there in which may predict us even before putting the ECMO whether this particular patient it is reversible or not. Till now we don't have any clear evidence from the literature but some factors which may be associated with uh, a successful weaning of the patient are one age. Uh, in youngsters probably you may be able to wean them off when compared to the senior citizens. In the same way, early initiation of disease before there are any chronic changes in the CT or in the active phase of the disease, that is in the second week of the phase where you see a typical full uh, extensive inflammatory phase leading to poor PF ratio. Initiation at that point may be more beneficial than putting it late in the fourth or fifth week where most probably what you're dealing with the fibrotic changes. Similarly, a super added infections, if that is a cause for a poor PF ratio, you can support them and treat them with appropriate antibiotics and other getting off <clears throat> once the infection component settles. Similarly, in patients in whom you have done active interventions like proning or mobilizations once you put them on ECMO. So that also may increase your chance of successful weaning the patient from the ECMO. So uh, this is how you approach a patient once you start weaning them off the ECMO as and when the lung starts improving. You go for a continuous assessment based upon your clinical, radiological, ventilation, and blood gas parameters. As in when you start seeing improvement, you start decreasing your ECMO support and try to get it off as and when it is possible. So these are the two ways by which you can decrease your ECMO support. One where you gradually decrease your sleep gas flow. Uh, initially, it may be six liters or seven liters. Then you start coming down and you just see for an acceptable gas exchange in the blood gas. And once the sweep gas is less than one liter per minute, then you give a total trial off of sweep gas and watch for a few hours and then take off ECMO if the patient is tolerating well. Uh, similarly, the other strategy is to decrease the ECMO flows where you decrease the uh, flows water initially going on as you see in the video. And once your flows are less than two liters per minute and if the patient is tolerating well, then you go for clamping the circuit, both the venous and arterial side of the circuit. And then if the patient is tolerating well, then you go for a trial, uh, go for a decarbonization of this patient. In any case, before you proceed weeding and uh, taking the patient off the ECMO, you have to rule out all treatable and reversible causes like a pneumothorax, pleural effusion, or any mucus plex, so that uh, you have an optimal condition before you get it out. You should have a normal hemodynamic status with a good cardiac function. You should have an acceptable ventilator settings where your FAO2 of 60% or less you so that you have a room in case the patient deteriorates. Uh, you will see that often that the CO2 removal may need a support for a longer time compared to oxygenation before you get them off. And it's always good to have a trial off for a longer time. Typically, we wait for one day before we get the ECMO off. And once
once that's tolerated, you plan for a decannulation. And while you're decannulating, at the same time, you have a clear plan for how we're going to rehabilitate these patients, which is very, very important in these cases. So with that brief, let us look at the main part of the day, that is ECMO in a COVID patient and how you're going to handle it when this particular patient is going for a transplantation. So to look into it, uh, the number of patients who have underwent transplant being supported on ECMO for COVID-19 across the globe is very small. I think the number may be touching a maximum of 50. The good thing is a large number of them have been done in our country. In our center, we have done close to 12 cases uh, whom we have supported on ECMO for COVID-19 and underwent transplant. Uh, as you see, this is appropriate only for a small number of patients. When you compare the total number of patients who are affected in a pandemic, these numbers which have done more where is very small. But nevertheless, that's a significant one. And for the patients who are pushed to the top shin, uh, that makes a surviving difference in these cases. The International Society of Heart and Lung Transplantation have set guidelines on choosing up of a patient when should they be considered for a transplant. If you look at the guidelines in brief one, that should be considered only once 28 days have lapsed from the onset of symptoms, not less than four weeks from the onset of symptoms. There is a severe lung injury, which is irreversible upon rate radiological evaluation. We need to do a radiological evaluation in that it should be clear that this lung injury is severe and it is non-reversible in nature. You should be having only a single organ failure and there should be two RT-PCRs which are done 24 to 48 hours apart and they should be both negative and one of the samples should be a deep sample taken using a bronchoscope. So these guidelines should be considered before we list a patient for a transplantation. Similarly, ISHLT has set up data on how to utilize an organ, the donor lung, keeping the uh, COVID-19 into perspective. If you have a donor who has been exposed to confirmed or suspected case of COVID-19 within past 10 days, you can still, and he becomes a donor, you can still go ahead and use the organ provided the donor has been asymptomatic and at least seven days has been passed since the time you have been exposed and you need to do an RT-PCR, which is negative. Similarly, you need to do a CT chest and that clearly shows that there is no active pulmonary infection or sequelae of the COVID in the patient. Okay. Similarly, you can utilize the organ for a patient who has been previously affected by COVID-19. That also can be considered in high-risk cases. That is only if the there is a total clinical resolution of the symptoms and at least 21 days have been lapsed from the time the patient has been first diagnosed to have COVID-19. And the CT scan shows that there is no residual lung disease. Your RT-PCR is totally negative, two of them rather. That is when you can consult uh, that patient who is willing to donate as a donor for the lung. Okay, so keeping all this aside, let us look at practically how do we manage a patient who is on ECMO due to COVID-19 coming for a transplant. So these are the criteria what we set apart at our institute, more or less similar like the ISHLD, at least four weeks of ECMO support, that is more than 28 days being a patient on ECMO support. But what we do is at the end of two weeks, if we don't see significant signs of improvement, we do counsel all the transplant, all the patients for transplant and starts listing them because at the end of four weeks, then you start the process, then there will be again a huge waiting list, uh, with a huge period of waiting before they get an organ. So what we do in this four weeks period when they are on the ECMO, we do two CT scans with an interval of around 10 to 14 days. And both the CTs uh, before we consider for transplant should be showing a disease which is not reversible and there is a progressive destruction. That's what we see when the lungs go back. You do CTs at 10, in 10 weeks and 10, 10 days interval, even four to five times apart also, that's over a period of two months. You see that every subsequent, every CT is worse than the previous CT, okay? Then you have tried all the conventional measures and all of them have failed. That is, you try to prone the patient, you try to mobilize them. In spite of all this, the lung is not showing any signs of recovery and you're not able to wean them off ECMO support. Apart from this, they should be having only a single organ dysfunction, that is a lung, or a, maybe a temporary uh, secondary organ dysfunction, like a mildly raised creatinine or something which can be easily reversible. They should be neurologically normal and the cutoff what we keep at our place is close to 65 years. More than 65 years will be considered as a case-by-case -case basis. 
So it is very, very challenging to manage these cases. As such, lung transplant itself is in a uh, surgery which puts a huge challenge in the entire perioperative period. And uh, those patients who are on, because COVID-19 on ECMO, that makes it even more complex. So in these cases, what is the main issue is the uncertain waiting period. You don't know how long you're going to wait. The donors, though they are available, they are significantly less when compared to what they are there in the pre-pandemic time. So you don't know how long this patient is going to wait on the ECMO. So your primary target target in all these cases who are waiting for the transplant in the preoperative period is one, to keep them alive till you get an organ and to keep them fit so that they can undergo the organ transplant. So that's what remains your primary target, keep them alive and keep them fit. So you have various challenges that comes in front of you. The challenges, one in maintaining the ECMO for long term, as we have seen, you're going to consider it only at the end of close to one month of ECMO support. After that, you have a period of waiting time before you actively get an organ that may extend up to a period of another four to six weeks beyond. So you should be technically ready to support these cases up to two and a half months before you really consider them for a transplant. And similarly, a lot of secondary complications do come in in between uh, these patients when you're managing them while waiting for an organ. So let us look one by one in the pre-operative period. In the first and foremost thing, what you look at these cases is a neuromuscular problem. Uh, and the initial phase of the pandemic, when the ECMOs were done outside and we were getting the cases purely for the further management or a transplant, a lot of these cases were heavily sedated, paralyzed, and managed outside before they came to us. When we try to make them awake, we see that a significant number of them without no active physio being received were having a severe critical illness neuropathy. Uh, it was so severe that the patient will be fully conscious but he won't be able to move even the fingertip also. It will be so bad. Uh, this needs an extensive physiotherapy from that point to recover. And often that recovery takes much longer than the patient waiting on uh, ECMO, not recovering, listening for transplant, getting a transplant done, and finally coming out with a normal lung uh, post-transplant. Even, even then, the critical illness neuromyopathy would not have totally settled. So it is very common in this patient. So that's why I put the neuromuscular as the first thing that we need to optimize in the preoperative period. Uh, we totally cut down the sedation and keep a minimal possible sedation in this patient and consider paralyzing only if it is really required. Otherwise, we don't paralyze our patient. They go for an active physiotherapy, which is very, very important. You may start with initially passive, then you have to go for active physiotherapy. Every day, it's a routine that in the morning, they may be made to sit in the bedside by the chair, and they may be made to stand for some time using a straight lasing test. And every day, we speak with our physio team without fail key. How is this patient doing from the neuromuscular point of view. Is there any specific weakness in any muscle group? If yes, then what can be done to strengthen that muscle group that will be addressed to this? So the first and foremost thing when you're listing a patient for a transplant is the neuromuscular strength maintenance in these cases. Uh, the second thing which is of equal importance is the infection control and sepsis management. So this is one of the major causes of morbidity and mortality. This is one of the things which changes the case from patient who is actively cons being considered to transplant to a patient who is not fit for transplant. Once the MOD sets in, then they're not fit for transplant. So this is something which should be very actively looked into and managed. So when you're looking at the pre-operative maintenance of this patient, infection control is a very important factor that should be looked into in the pre-operative maintenance. We try to minimize all the lines that we can put for this patient, even if there are lines, try to change them at regular intervals and take out anything that is unnecessary, maybe four lays or maybe totally take them off the ventilator, just put them on oxygen if it is re repeatedly having respiratory tract infections and keep an open eye for this infection. So it's not uncommon in whatever the patients we have done. We have seen that some of them we may have to take up for surgery even after having an active septic attack. The patient might have had an active septic attack in the morning hours. In the night, once you get an organ, you may have to take him. So by the time you take him, uh, he may be on two pressers or three pressers when, you, uh, when, they, when he's being built into it for the surgery. So when these lungs were explanted, and these cases, you do see that they behave in a very typical way that they keep having that septic attacks. So your blood cultures may be negative. There is no other cells. You have changed your lines. There's no active pus or anything coming in anywhere else in the body. So your possible or the probable source in this case is the damaged lung, which has harbored the bugs and just keep releasing that septic shaws or septic emulate at regular intervals. When these lungs were explanted and when they were dissected out, when they were examined, and a lot of 
of cases we have noticed that there were multiple cavities of pus uh, that were from the small to the large size or whatever the size they may be as large as the size of a tennis ball or maybe very small microscopic that, that uh, the, these act these pus uh, filled cavities are the active sources of infection which will be throwing septic emboli at regular intervals so the only way of sepsis control in this patient was to get the native lung out and rather we see that they do behave well or the the, num- the amount of constrictors what you have or what you're supporting them do come down once you uh, get out the native lung of uh, after the native lung expansion. So other important thing in these patients are the fungal infections, which are very common, especially the mouths. You have to keep an active eye and start looking around for them and treat them at the early stage before they become a systemic problem. Similarly, cytomegaloviral infections are also very common in these cases in the entire perioperative period, both in the intraoperative, preoperative and the postoperative period. That should also be actively looked into in these cases. So the next important thing when you're looking for long term is to uh, treat or prevent ECMO complications uh, when you're sort of thinking of supporting for long term. The, when you speak of complications of VV ECMO, the first and foremost comes out your bleeding episodes. So what we do is we minimize the anticoagulation and start looking for alternative step in whenever the uh, platelet counts falls less than one lakh. You keep a serial monitoring of the coagulation parameters, including point of care tests that guides you about the transfusion replacement or replacement of the blood products in these patients. And as in when you have any doubt that the patient is going for any bleeding episode, you involve your interventional teams at your earliest, whether it's the gastroenterology team or it is interventional radiology team, so that that is adequately handled. The other challenges when you're looking at a long-term support in these cases are cannulation sites. They may develop wounds, especially when you're trying to mobilize them. You may have to change cannulation sites. We have done in some few cases where you uh, site a different site for cannulation. <clears throat> then similarly, when you're talking of two or two and a half months of support on ECMO, uh, invariably you may have to change the circuit in this patient. So these are the cases. Uh, these are the cases where you you you're clear that your lung is totally damaged and destroyed. That's not contributing anything to the oxygenation. They're going to wait for the transplantation, and they're entirely dependent on ECMO. So circuit change uh, is going to be a drill, which is very very uh, risky in these patients. Usually, we do it with close to ten to twenty people uh, involving multiple teams. One to work on the uh, leg end of the cannula, second team to work on the head end of the cannula. One to manage the patient, one to handle the machine, and one to oversee the process. And then entire process of circuit change barely takes 10 seconds or less than that. Even though it is so short, you see that they go for episodes of severe desaturation or bradycardia. So this should be done under supervision with the maximum possible team to prevent any complications. So the other thing which is uh, very important in preoperative maintenance of these patients is the nutrition. So daily, we are supposed to meet and discuss with our dietitian or the nutrition therapist about the nutrition plan for this patient. Keep a close eye whether they're getting <clears throat> catabolic or anabolic. But this is one of the most important aspects, which is to be handled in the pre-operative period. You go with the standard, any nutrition assessment scales or scores. And if you're not able to meet by the adequate uh, rice shoe feeds, we may have to supplement, especially the protein component by a partial parental nutrition to see that they remain anabolic and they don't end up in losing the weight. So what we usually do is we go for a full rice shoe feed if required a partial parental nutrition in terms of protein supplementation. And we encourage oral intake of all the patients throughout the day, especially when they're sitting by the bedside. Uh, we let them have whatever they want orally. So uh, then the other organ systems which we need to maintain in the preoperative period, neurologically, we do see that some of them slip into encephalopathy, that is either a COVID encephalopathy or a septic encephalopathy. Once the active infection has been treated or is being ruled out, you give a course of immunoglobulin and support them for some time, you see that they start coming back to normal stage. Uh, same way, cardiac, uh, especially looking from the coronary artery disease and pulmonary hypertension, RV uh, function point of view has to be uh, evaluated and kept training the preoperative to prepare for the postoperative issues. Uh, renal and liver issues can arise because of multiple things, maybe because of sepsis and morts, maybe one of the common causing factors. So that should be again actively looked into. We should try to minimize the transmission to avoid the immunological load and look for alternative loads like supplementing IV iron to handle anemia and all. And finally, the most important thing is the psychological assessment and psychological support. This includes not just the patient, but the family member, because you're going to keep them awake, 
you're going to give them for a prolonged time, maybe two months before the transplant, another one month or two months post transplant. So you're talking of a patient who is going to be in the hospital or in the ICU for three months or so. So psychological assessment and psychological support or counseling becomes very, very important for both the patient and the family members. With that, let us look at what is significant or in, uh, in the intraoperative period of this patient. As it has been clearly written there, the most important factor or the most important concern in this patient is the bleeding in the intraoperative period. This is because of the lot of raw surface, raw inflamed surface with multiple vascular collaterals and adhesions in the pleural cavity. These patients do bleed a lot, right? From the time when the surgeon puts the skin incision, uh, both in the a time when they're trying to expand the native lung or in the expandation time or in the post expand time, your major thing what you find or you fight in the intraoperative period is the bleeding, bleeding, and bleeding. So they can have hemodynamic instability and you end up in transfusing multiple things. What makes things even more complicated is since they are already on two to three months in a stage of disease, uh, the native lung would have totally shrunk and not just the lung, the thoracic cavity itself will shrunk in size. So the thoracic volume that is available will be proportionately less or the working space that is both for the surgeons to work and to compare the size of the uh, lung to fit in, the, uh, the new lung that's going to come fit in will be much smaller compared to the same height patient uh, in these cases. The other intraoperative issues are the donor. Uh, we don't know when we are going to get a donor for this patient uh, since it's a pandemic time and the availability of donors is not as same as they were the, before the pandemic. So quite a, or quite a good amount of time, you may be forced to accept a borderline donor that you do only after discussing with the family and take a consent from them. So when you mean a borderline donor, you mean in terms of uh, your PF ratios may not be optimal. Ideally, you need more than 350 to accept a PF ratio for, as a a donor lung. But here you may be accepting something around 200 to 250 also if there is a treatable cause. Similarly, a size mismatch usually you may not accept. But in this case, you don't know when you're going to get the next organ. You don't know whether your patient will be fit enough to maintain till that point of time. So you may go ahead and accept the case. Similarly, infection also, if there is some mild infection in the donor lung, <coughs> you may go ahead and accept that thing. So that becomes a challenge in uh, managing and maintaining in the intraoperative and the postoperative period, a donor lung with a borderline coming from a borderline donor. Uh, and coming to the immunosuppression, usually we don't go for an induction therapy in these cases because they're very fragile. You go only for a very small doses of steroids, which are given in the intraoperative period, followed by maintenance with the tree drug regimen from the postoperative day one. So keeping all these factors to start with, one, they are on the ECMO. Second, uh, you're looking from a significant risk of bleeding, multiple transfusions, <coughs> even in the preoperative period itself, you're trying to take from a donor <clears throat> where it may be a borderline organ, plus the patient may be having pulmonary hypertension. Keeping all these factors, it is not uncommon to face a graft dysfunction. These are all the risk factors to have a primary graft dysfunction. Graft dysfunction is your transplanted lung may not be working optimally the way you want it to work, and there is no reversible treatable cause for that. That's when you call it a primary graft dysfunction. So it's quite common to face a graft dysfunction. You try to manage it. If not, you may have to support them on ECMO for a few days, maybe 48 to 72 hours in the post-operative period till the donor lung becomes better and able to work on its own. So coming to the post-operative period, again, the first and foremost thing that troubles you is the bleeding in these patients, a multitude of factors as we have discussed before. Your point of care test helps us in identify, <coughs> identifying the right way of managing the bleeding, <clears throat> whether that needs a surgical exploration or can be medically managed. If that doesn't work, uh, then another strategy, usually what the <clears throat> surgeons do is keep the chest open. They keep the chest open for first 48 to 72 hours in some cases, and then go for a delayed chest closure once all the bleeding settles. It's not uncommon uh, for these patients to have bleeding almost amounting to an liter per day in the post-operative period. The second important thing in the prolonged course, what they have post-operative period is, again, the infections. Uh, the immunosuppression, what we are going to give, uh, increases the risk of infection in these patients. So that should be always kept an eye and they need a regular bronchoscopic clearance and uh, that should be actively managed. So what is important is the fungal infections and the CMV which can happen in the second week onwards that should be actively looked into especially the CMV. Any new onset radiological change, any new onset clinical condition change in the <coughs> clinical parameters like WBC count and all, you should actively look for the <coughs> cytomegalovirus infection 
can start handling it. Then immunosuppression, standard is a three drug regimen, but you try to titrate it in based upon the clinical condition. You don't try to go for an over immunosuppression in these cases. You decide based upon your clinical status and the laboratory investigations and side effects of immunosuppressants is something which you need to keep a close watch. Since you are so careful with your immunosuppression, there's a risk of having rejection in the immediate post-operative period. You keep a close eye, you go for a radiological evaluation followed by an endobranchial biopsy as and when required. Uh, and whenever you have a cytomegalovirus infection, the risk of someone having a, a rejection always increases. So that should be kept in mind and managed. And finally, the most important thing in the post-operative period, the rehabilitation. If we have worked on this well enough in the pre-operative period, that should help us in a, a big way in handling the post-operative period, both active and physiotherapy, taking care of nutrition. Uh, these patients especially do have G-reflex and aspiration, so that should be kept in the mind. And infection control parameters will help us in a huge way in handling them in the post-operative period. So these are just the photos of the expand, expanded lung, which have been uh, totally damaged. As you can see that what the surgeon is showing here is the uh, ab abscess, what they have there. Multiple cavities full of pus, and uh, some of them will be so bad that uh, they'll be having empyema, and then the chest should just keep straining continuously the pus. That's the physiotherapy equipment that is used in these cases. Uh, let us look at the few uh, literature things, interesting, uh, interesting points. Uh, the first transplant for the COVID lung was done by an Indian surgeon of U.S. origin. That is where all it started. He has done in the U.S., uh, followed by the first case in our country has been done at our center at the MGM. This is, again, a paper where the teams from four countries have published it together. MGM is a part of it. Then this is one of our case, a 64-year-old gentleman who was on ECMO close to 73 days, was not recovering. Then finally, we did transplant and post-transplant, he has been sent home. This is again an interesting development. In India, what we have is the donation from the brain death cases. We don't have donation after the cardiac death. We don't have uh, donations from the live donors. Uh, this is a case report from Japan where the uh, donation from the live donors has been uh, done for a COVID-19 case where you can see the lung has been extensively damaged and the patient did well post-transplant. Let us look at the final part of talk, uh, ECMO support to nowhere. So when we say the ECMO support to nowhere, we're talking about the patients in whom the lung is totally destroyed and in whom the chance of it recovering is almost not there. You're confirmed by the radiological and clinical parameters. And obviously, second to this, you're unable to wean off ECMO support at all in this patient. And these cases, again, not just the lung is totally damaged. This patient are either one, they're not willing for transplant, uh, the lung is totally damaged, but the patient doesn't want to get a transplant done. Or second, there is some organ, secondary organ dysfunction, like a chronic kidney disease or something else, or patient may, may not be maybe having an encephalopathy kind of picture, which makes him not a candidate for a transplant. So a patient is either not willing for transplant or patient is not a candidate for transplant. Or the third situation, which is very well possible, is non-availability of donor. You may have listed for transplant, patient may be a candidate for transplant, but it so happens that maybe because of the pandemic, the, there is no donor that is available or there may be a lot of waiting lists before this patient there is no donor that is available. So in these kind of situations, that is where we uh, we land up in that situation as ECMO support to nowhere. Every day when you go for pay rounds, you may see that your patient is fully conscious, otherwise vitals are stable, but you don't have a clear plan there. Your transplant plan is not working out and you're very clear that this lung is not going to recover. You are in a very tricky situation. So what can be done? Um, probably nothing much can be done, but these are the few thoughts which I can share. Uh, we can put in all efforts to wean and probably in accept and higher or a maximum ventilator support, usually less than 70 FAO2 is what we accept before we get them off the ECMO support. But here, probably you can accept a higher and see whether you can get them off the ECMO support, put them on ventilator again, which is very high risk. There may be high chance that they may go back on ECMO support, but still see whether you can support them with that. If the patient is otherwise fit, is not willing for a transplant, you can consider re-counseling them for a transplant. Probably they may do understand after a couple of counselings the importance of what we are seeing. Uh, if none of these do work, then again, uh, we, we may land up in a situation where we don't have much options. One, we may just have to continue the care and maximum we can do is non-escalation of support is what we can do. And finally, uh, withdrawing the support may not be an option in our country because of the legal issues in these kind of cases. To conclude, I would say that the 
the VVECMO is a good tool uh, for a bridge to recovery. Uh, it has saved a lot of patients in this pandemic and it will continue to save. Uh, as a transplant also is a good option in these patients in the selected few uh, in whom we can make a difference. ECMO can be used as a bridge in these cases. Uh, the two factors which are very important are the patient's condition and second is the donor availability. Uh, we may land up in a situation where we are going to nowhere on an ECMO support. That's quite tricky. Uh, we may have to take a call depending upon case-to-case -case basis. In any case, whatever the thing as a bridge to recovery or a bridge to transplant. So what is very important is a group critical care in managing these kind of patients. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Murli Krishna. Now let's welcome our final speaker for the day, Dr. Venkata Raman Arun, who will be talking about ECMO during a pandemic, when and how of resource utilization. Over to you, Dr. Venkata Raman Arun. Good evening, everybody. Uh, at the start, I'd like to thank uh, ASA and Dr. Naveen for asking me to be part of this webinar. Uh, we've been going through very bad times and uh, I think uh, I work out of Bangalore so our caseloads have been going up on a daily basis. Uh, we are probably touching about three lakh active cases. So been a bit busy and uh, tiring to say the least. My, now my primary interest is liver transplant and along with that, I get involved in ICU mainly for ventilation strategies and ECMO. Uh, we are not a very high volume ECMO center. We do only about roughly about 10 a year, not more than that. Uh, it's a mix of pulmonary cases, poisonings, and uh, cardiac cases. Our lung transplant program is just starting. So a lot of it is based on uh, looking at data and looking at how people have been doing it rather than personal experience at the moment. Now, uh, I, I thought I'll talk about uh, ECMO during a pandemic because that's what we are in the middle of at the moment. Now, the first thing to look at is, is ECMO justified COVID for COVID-19? I think a lot of uh, the speakers before me would have touched on this and they probably have presented the reasons why it is valid. Now, if you look at it, uh, it's shown to have almost 60% recovery to short to long-term rehab. Now, this is an ELSO data, and this also is quite similar to the other causes of respiratory uh, diseases where ECMO has been used. So yes, in short, if it's a clinical need, the patient should be able to fulfill it and he should be able to go on to an ECMO. Now, does it change a lot when it is in a pandemic? Uh, unfortunately, a lot of things change in a pandemic. This is the size at which, which we are experiencing at the moment. Uh, our perspectives also change. We change from individual benefit to the greater good. Even for clinicians, unfortunately, this is a change which we have to incorporate in our daily activity. I think on a large scale, it's been going on. People are you changing the way they think about it. And uh, it's no longer just the one patient in front of you, you have to think about the next patient and the patient who's coming after that or the patient who misses a chance for having some kind of a treatment done. So yes, a pandemic changes everything. Now you have to realize in a pandemic, there are some bottlenecks and the main issues are staffing and equipment. Uh, these are quite uh, stark in terms of uh, any kind of pandemic and the ones which we are dealing with at the moment, uh, everybody would have realized both these are uh, bottlenecks, which is very difficult to uh, get through. Now staffing, yes, it's for all the doctors, the nurses and the additional staff like the perfusionists or the physiotherapists and the respiratory therapists. We're looking at staffing at all levels and their availability 24 seven. Now, there is a lot of overlap and responsibility between all these specialities. A uh, lot of them can be utilized elsewhere in a pandemic. Most of the times the doctors and nurses are utilized elsewhere. Even to a certain extent, the respiratory therapists and the physiotherapists have to do other activities, other jobs, especially in a COVID pandemic where they end up having to prone patients regularly or manage their ventilatory strategies. 
So all these people have additional responsibilities. They have additional uh, areas to cover. So yes, there is a crunch in the numbers and there's a crunch in their availability. And the other thing you have to remember is they have to be available 24 seven for an ECMO patient. Now, the problems are multifold here. One is the requirement elsewhere. The other thing you have to remember is staff themselves are getting infected. So you're looking at, uh, even if you have a good number of three or four perfusionists and you can run a 24 seven system otherwise, you're looking at perfusionists going off sick. Then they go in, either go off sick or go on to quarantine. It's almost 14 days, 10 to 14 days. So you lose that one person there for 10 days. So a lot of responsibility then falls onto whoever is left over. So these are things which you have to think of. These are problems that you have to look at. And other thing is exposure to all these stuff which may happen at any given time. They get exposed to the disease. They get exposed uh, at work. Even if they're vaccinated, there's always a worry that they carry it back home. And then at home, they will expose their family, friends. So it's a big uh, risk which these patients and people have to take. And you have to realize that that also makes a difference on how many people are able to get in and do these uh, do an ECMO in an infected uh, COVID positive patient. Now, the other thing which you have to look at is the infrastructure per se. Now, most of these uh, COVID patients are isolated into COVID ICUs. They're not managed in a primary ECMO area. So a non-ECMO uh, area like a medical ICU or an isolated ICU or a newly created COVID ICU is where these patients are being managed till they become negative or they are in a stable state to come out of there. So you have looking at managing an ECMO in this kind of an area. And there is a lot of non-ECMO caseload in that area. Nursing staff and doctors are stretched to the limits looking after patients who actually don't need ECMO, but need a lot of other resources. People being turned, kept on ventilators for long duration, they're being turned prone and supine. So there is a lot of workload in that area, which again makes it quite difficult to start an ECMO or initiate an ECMO in that kind of an area and run well. The issues will always be that be, because these are isolated areas, uh, there's not a lot of resource available. Initiation becomes difficult. Monitoring them on a routine basis becomes difficult. And bigger, the a bigger worry is troubleshooting. If something does happen to the pump or does happen to the patient, troubleshooting is again very difficult, especially out of us. So you it's not just simply putting it and then hoping that it runs well. There are a lot of other issues and a lot of problems in terms of running it and in, uh, monitoring the ECMO itself. Now, going to the other issue, there, there is a big problem now with uh, equipment and consumables. Now, uh, equipment may be available. You may have uh, in adequate amounts of uh, uh, ECMO pumps available, but a bigger problem is the consumables. Now, off late, there has been a big uh, drop in consumable supplies and inter international supply chains missing. And even we've had, we, we, as I said, we are a low volume center. We have maximum two circuits in house. So suddenly we find that that's not enough. We seem to find that the, the vendor does not have the circuits. You ask the company, they do not have the circuits. And their reasoning is they are allocated only a certain amount towards the country and all that is finished and they're no longer able to bring it in into the country on time. So this kind of a loss in the international supply chain is again something that you have to think of because if you do not have a backup circuit and you're putting it on, you might suddenly find that your patient needs a replacement circuit and you don't have it on hand. So that's something that you have to worry about. And as usual, a lot of uh, cost goes up, especially when there is a demand and there's a um, reduced supply, you will find that the costing of all these goes up. 
Now, another thing which people overlook in a, a pandemic is most of the ECMO patients, to a certain extent at the start, need a fair amount of uh, blood or blood products. Now, you have to remember that in a pandemic, the blood bank is really starved. They're struggling to get blood and blood products. And uh, with the vaccination coming in, there are even less volunteers who are donating blood. So you have to look at a lot of other consumables which would normally consider as a normal supply or a normal thing which you would be getting it without any problems, suddenly going out of supply or you're not able to get hold of them. So you have to be careful on how you manage all your supplies. So a lot of these consumables which are normal for a hospital, even to a certain extent during a pandemic, suddenly become non-available. So this is something which you have to worry about. You also have to worry about things like the patient being dependent on a ventilator on ECMO for a long period of time. Now, this is a big uh, uh, resource-oriented problem because now suddenly we've found that a lot of hospitals are becoming oxygen depleted. They are running out of oxygen because oxygen is being used in a lot of wards, in a lot of non-critical areas where normally the oxygen consumption is low. So suddenly oxygen is something becoming, it's becoming very precious and people are having to have a very fast turnaround of the cylinders or the LMO plants. Hospitals which run with LMO plants are okay. The hospitals which are done with cylinders are suddenly finding that they're running out of oxygen at a drop of a hat. So these are again things which you have to consider before you think of putting a patient on an ECMO. So I've been talking about a lot of things which are different or more difficult in a pandemic. So does it mean to say that we do not do any kind of uh, ECMOs in a pandemic? Is it a complete no? Or do we need to look at each aspect and try and modify them so that we can actually manage, manage it during a pandemic as well? So conditions which may allow us for judicious use during a pandemic uh, are one, try and apply the best conventional strategies appropriate for that patient. Uh, the second thing is patient selection. Now, during a non a regular routine work, now we would accept a patient with a low but acceptable probability of benefit. So a patient who uh, may otherwise maybe may or may not come out of an ECMO, you might just say that fine, we'll accept it and then try and give them the best benefit of doubt. But during a pandemic, what you do have to realize is that most likely to benefit is the patient who needs to be picked up. You switch from giving uh, taking a low probability patient to somebody who actually is going to benefit from it and look at salvaging a patient who... Uh, who is probably going to benefit. Things like looking at a younger patient, looking at patients who have got uh, mild to moderate disease, which will probably come out. And rather than picking up the patient who are right at the extremes of severe disease or elderly, slightly elderly patients or older patients who may or may not come out of it. So these are things which uh, are clinical decisions. Unfortunately, clinicians don't like to make these dis decisions, but these are things which we'll have to do uh, if we have to still continue doing uh, ECMOs in a pandemic or try and salvage some patients from it. So what would happen normally, places like ours, which are low volume units, we would be doing uh, ECMOs. We would have a much higher uh, staffing ratio for each ECMO patient. We would be quite surplus in the number of things which are available to us. We'll be involving almost everybody around to try and do these ECMOs. And there would be teaching and training op opportunities for, uh, in most of these places. So you're looking at uh, almost everybody wanting to do an ECMO with some amount of luxury, which is there. Unfortunately, during a pandemic, you do not have these luxuries. So you have much lower staffing levels. You try and keep your staffing levels both for initiation and management at much uh, fewer numbers, try and get only the experienced staff in to avoid duplication. 
and try and retain some uh, retrain some staff to do to multitask rather than having two perfusionists to try and sort out the pump have only one have somebody standing outside instead of having a surgeon and an assistant surgeon and a scrub staff have only a surgeon and a scrub staff so you will have to start doing things the other thing which you will have to think of seriously is whether you can cohort these patients whether uh, a local hospital or, or in a group uh, group chain of hospitals whether one unit picks up all the ecmos whether if they've been doing it in two units or three units should one unit pick up all the ecmos and cohort these patients in i know people don't like to send them to other group other corporate hospitals or other hospitals but it would be a good idea to cohort these patients even between hospitals if it's possible because that's what would try, probably bring out the best kind of an outcome for these patients now larger volume centers are known to do better it's not that small volume centers don't do uh, do well but during a pandemic it's much better to have a large volume center dealing with it unfortunately a lot of high volume centers are traditionally built into cardiac units or transplant units now both these units are non ecmo units uh, sorry non covid units and they do not tend to have any kind of covid positive patient so these traditional units which have usually high volume are not the center of the cases during pandemic so this is where a bit of a give and take comes on how you manage and or whether you get in the staffing from these kind of units and then then do it in a covid center covid center so there are a lot of challenges in, and there are ways in which you can overcome this and try and still run ecmos at probably the best possible of it, to give the best possible outcome and with the best possible uh, uh, interest of the patient now these have all been looked at, at the, by silver et al and they had basically applied that apply the best conventional intensive care pre ecmo use intelligent patient selections they've thought about using ai to help with uh, in patient selections reorganize the staffing and cohort the ecmos so the, that's again something to think about especially in our uh, scenario where it's a bit more disjointed rather than in the west and uh, contribute to research now every covid ecmo which happens should probably go on to the elso's registry because then there would be some data to look back on and to try and be a bit better next time around so that's something which everybody needs to think about now is it unjustified yes there there is a view that the whole thing is unjustified and you should not be doing ecmos now this paper comes in from uh, this communi communication is from abraham et al now you have to realize that these two papers have also come from different corners of the of the globe uh, silvers uh, silvers are from australia where they had very few covid positive patients they managed them reasonably well and they were quite uh, forthright about doing ecmos on these kind of patients whereas abraham et al were are uh, from uh, new york and they went through one of the worst pandemics possible at some at one stage they were much worse than what india is at the moment so they were looking at ecmo from the other side of the lens and they were wondering whether it was justified or it was completely unjustified to do it now according to them they said crisis standard care every resource becomes critical so you do not look at an ecmo staffing is maxed out and this and if you start doing ecmo uh, this negatively impacts and uh, disproportionately impacts on non ecmo patients in the same area so uh, this is their view in terms of uh, how a pandemic makes things difficult now if you look at uh, how the ecmo volume is during a pandemic this is interestingly what they came out so initially when the patient the pandemic levels are a bit low but the patients are there and patients who uh, fulfill the criteria for going on an ecmo you would be putting a lot of ecmos in place so you would be putting more and more patients in there now when there is a surge level of pandemic and then there is a huge number of patients who 
come into the hospital or come into the system, your ECMO volume suddenly starts to drop off. And to a certain extent, if you look at the bottom of the scale, it's a U-shaped curve, and the bottom on where it's a dotted line, you can almost stop doing ECMO. So this area, at some stage, you may even just stop doing your ECMOs. This is at a surge level. Now, again, post surge, you'll again start having a bit more uh, relaxation in terms of resource availability, a bit more of your staff would be available, but still there would be patients who would be coming through who might benefit from an ECMO. So again, at this point, your ECMO patient volumes will start going, down, go, going up, whereas your total number of COVID positive patients might be going down. So this is a kind of a U-shaped curve, which they suggested that might be happening with most ECMO utilization uh, when they go through a pandemic. Now, looking at all of this, ELSO has also come up with a few recommendations and uh, on how to do an ECMO or when to do an ECMO during a pandemic. Now, their statement initially is that if you have conventional capacity, that is the capacity is running smoothly, there are no hiccups, there are no issues with the system. Uh, judicious use of ECMO and proper case selection, you can continue to do ECMO. And uh, as long as that capacity exists, select your patient properly, offer whichever kind of ECMO is, is required, things like a VA, VV, to extend it to COVID-19 patients and use your ECMOs for your non-COVID-19 indications as well. Uh, ECPRs, uh, they said, keep it only down to expert centers. So this is, if it's a conventional capacity and things are run, running smoothly, which is probably what the West is facing at the moment. Now, if there is contingency and it's capacity tier one, the system's running with an expanded capacity, triage the maximum number of ECMOs to improve outcomes. So triage them with resource, based on the resource benefit ratio. VA, VV ECMOs in younger patients with single organ failure is what you should be thinking of. Judiciously, judiciously use ECMO for non-COVID patients, non-COVID-19 patients. There you do not have whether it's a younger or older patient, but judicially you use it where you think it is indicated and stop offering eCPRs. If it worsens, if the surge worsens and there is an expanded capacity close to saturation, that is patients are pouring into your emergency, into your COVID ICU, restrict your ECMO selection criteria. Restrict it to prioritize non-COVID-19 indications who have a better chance of survival. VV ECMO in possibly younger single organ failures and stop offering VA ECMOs or eCPRs because VA ECMOs and eCPRs are more uh, labor intensive, more, need more staffing and more uh, monitoring. So stop offering those two. Now, if it goes on to the crisis capacity, system is overwhelmed, ECMO may no longer be appropriate. Concentrate resources to usual care. Capacity is overwhelmed. ECMO is not feasible in both COVID-19 and non-COVID-19 patients. Triage ICU admissions, considering seizing all futile care to create capacity in the system. Now, this is probably where we are at the moment. And probably this is a crisis capacity in India where we probably may not be able to offer the ECMO doesn't mean that going forwards, we may not be able to come back. We, we may come back onto the same U-shaped curve and we may be starting to offer ECMOs maybe going down a couple of weeks down the line. Uh, but looking at the scenario around us, we're probably sitting at crisis capacity and at the moment it may or may not be feasible, may not be right in offering ECMOs to either COVID-19 or non-COVID patients. Uh, thank you. And uh, my whole uh, statements, all these come from a, predominantly a low volume uh, ECMO center. I know some high volume centers might be having quite good results, but uh, uh, this is pretty much what we have taken on, on board, saying that probably we'll not offer ECMOs at the moment, but I'm open to comments from everybody else. Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Venkata Raman Arun. Now I request our moderator, Dr. Suresh Rao KG, to start the discussion session. And I request all the speakers to join into the session. Proning on ECMO. You know, because the ECMO is only a bridge to recovery. It will not treat the lung. So obviously you need to do something for the recovery of uh, lungs. So my question is to Dr. Arpan. Uh, Dr. Arpan is here. Yeah, so regarding proning on ECMO, you must have done a lot of uh, ECMO. Yes, sir, because uh, yeah. the proning on ECMO was no, never uh, practiced uh, before, uh, like in COVID. And we had to prone them even on ECMO for multiple times. In last one patient is still there who I have, uh, um, I have uh, proned at least 11 episodes of proning even on ECMO and his uh, white out lung has bit of open up after that. So uh, proning has become a routine practice uh, on uh, in COVID uh, nowadays. And uh, two things we do actually uh, regarding the first question, what you asked regarding the tracheostomy. Uh, I have uh, kept tracheostomy uh, far away from the first week because uh, I have found, I don't know what is your experience and the Vivexer's experience, uh, with uh, tracheos uh, endotracheal tube in C2, proning is easier than the tracheostomies uh, because that suction and all these things are not very uh, fine. And second thing is uh, 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 the proning, uh, if you have a bilateral femoral cannula, it is easier to prone. Uh, 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 than these uh, neck cannulas. Uh, a lot of less precautions uh, to be taken and they, uh, it can be prone because a large number of ECMOs are running because uh, now uh, I'm running all 27 ECMOs. So if I have to prone at least seven patients, you not, need not to be present in all proning. So uh, my sisters can prone them also. So that's why I'm telling you, this too has uh, eased out the, my proning thing. And we are proning left to right to give some uh, a good data. But we don't prone the patient's initial 48 hours because I, I believe some settlement is required uh, for the initial 48 hours before, because I have lost few patients within 24 to 48 hours because of severe storm. And uh, I could not save them even on ECMO. So I just give them 48 hours time and then I start proning. So what are your criteria to decide the uh, decide to prone a patient because uh, when do you think prone will help when it will not help is it routinely you do that or uh, you have some criteria to prone them uh, sir first criteria where we are uh, we have uh, I've started proning it was the refractory hypoxia even on ECMO if you are not able to uh, manage a saturation of more than uh, 90, even on uh, good flow you are getting and the, uh, your lung is not contributing at all, then I started proning them. But I have just uh, uh, pre-empty uh, uh, pre proning have started when the patients have bilateral white out chest x-rays and you have uh, a good amount of secretions are coming out. The very good mobilization of secretions has been done on proning and after getting them supine, you do a bronchoscopy, you get good results out of that. So almost proning this bilateral whiteout chest excess, I'm taking for uh, earlier proning. Yeah, that's nice to know. What uh, usually we do this CT scan, if we find a lot of uh, collapse, consolidation in the posterior aspects of the lung. We know that yeah. the proning will help and invariably during proning, we get a better saturation, better tidal volume. And uh, yeah, probably uh, it's of more beneficial effects in most of the cases. Yeah. Coming to the next question to uh, Dr. Murli. Uh, most of the uh, speakers spoke about uh, using two cannula for the vena vena secmo. So how do you place the dual limon cannula for the ECMO. How often you use it? What are the <clears throat> so, am, am I audible, sir? Yes. Hello. Am I audible? You are. Yes. Uh, 
Yes, yes, sir. So dual stage cannula placement, uh, I mean, it, it's associated with both benefits and risks. The main benefit is the ease of mobilization of the patient. So you can make him sit, you can make him stand, and if possible, you can take a few steps also if the patient is on a dual stage cannula. At the same time, it has a couple of disadvantages. The first disadvantage is at the time of insertion. If you're putting at a patient who is quite sick, and if you're putting at a remote center, not in the place where, uh, I mean, not in your institution, uh, placing dual stage requires a little of expertise and a little of help from both uh, ECHO and CAT lab if it is required. So it may not be possible both in terms of the expertise, I mean, or the equipment that is available in the remote center where you're doing one. And second, it may not be feasible if the patient is quite sick uh, to try to put a dual stage cannula and try to optimally position it, especially if he's desaturating. So ideally is in those kind of things, put the patient on uh, two cannulas, go on VV ECMO, once, he's, once you are done with all the proning cycles, if you want to mobilize him, uh, in that situation, you can convert it back from the single uh, to the single dual stage cannula where you can easily mobilize him. Other situation where we may have to go for only dual stage cannulas is if both the femoral veins are not in a position to be used. Like to start with, the patient is already having a deep penis thrombosis or for some reason, the veins were punctured and they're all collapsed. You're not able to cannulate a femoral vein. In that situation, you may not be able to do. Or in some cases, at your own place, if the patient gives you ample time where you can position uh, the cannula safely and patient is not crashing for desaturation, you can electively go and put a dual stage cannula. Okay. Do you find any challenges in uh, proper placement of the cannula? Yes, uh, placing the dual stage cannula ne needs expertise and uh, definitely, I mean, practice and expertise, and it is uh, definitely challenging and uh, compared to putting a single cannula. Uh, we can do it bedside using echocardiography, uh, making sure a guideware has gone to IVC and making sure the cannula oh, is optimally placed, the, both the drainages in the SVC and IVC and the return uh, back in the RIT HM. You can confirm it by using both transthoracic and transis visual echo and uh, use a CAT lab services if you're having issues with imaging or if you're unsure of the position. Okay. The other question is, uh, when do you decide about the veno-arterial ECMO? V-ECMO and... Veno-arterial ECMO. Oh. Veno-arterial ECMO in a patient with... Co yes, sir. Sir, in a patient with COVID, we know arterial ECMO, uh, if you have indications clearly or if there is a myocarditis with an EF of less than 20%, that is where you have to think, even in those patients, if adequate cardiac output is maintained, we can see whether we can manage them with a VV ECMO alone. Other situation where we may really require a VA ECMO is uh, when the patient is having a near arrest. I mean, if we see patients just coming to the place with quite badly desaturating by the time you are ready and you're going to put, if they go for a near arrest kind of situation, that's where as a rescue, if you're not able to revive them, you may have to use a VA ECMO. But in these situations where you have a good heart, uh, right after putting off VA ECMO very shortly, maybe within uh, a few hours or maybe instantly, we may have to do it a VAV. Uh, to make sure that there is no not source syndrome because they'll be having a good heart. And if it is a poor, pure peripheral VA, you will see that their upper limb will have a lesser saturation because of the not source syndrome. And uh, the other situation where we may end up in VA is in patients having very high pulmonary hypertension. If they go into an RV failure, your CP starts going up, even if you start nitric oxide or any other thing that doesn't help. Those are the situations where we end up in VA. A cardiac arrest or a, is a COVID myocarditis with a very severe LV dysfunction associated with a low cardiac output or pulmonary hypertension leading to right ventricular failure. I mean, both pulmonary embolism also can happen in these patients. Yes, the pulmonary embolism with the cardiogenic shocks. So the next question is to Dr. Arun. Um, yeah, a cardiac test. Yeah, question from Dr. Sunil. Can we do ECMO if patient is having bronchopleural fistula? Oh, you can uh, definitely do if you're having a bronchopleural fistula. And in one way, you actually might be better off because if you do manage to get them on the ECMO, you can think of uh, getting them spontaneous and getting them even extubated because th that's what will stop the bronchopleural fistula from uh, worsening. Uh, and a pneumothorax from worsening. So uh, it, if the patient deserves an ECMO and needs an ECMO, probably, yes, you can definitely do with the bronchopleural fistula. It might actually get the patient better. 
a few of our patients have had pneumothoraxes and then you ended up having to put icds and they've had constant leaks so we actually found that it helps when you cut down on your ventilating pressures your ventilation strategy gets better you do get better with those patients yes i think uh, covid pneumonia a lot of patients will have pneumothorax bronchopleural fistula they may develop it on ecmo or uh, before ecmo so as uh, dr arun noted the spontaneous ventilation definitely helps sometimes we have used the bronchial blockers also to prevent any uh, airway pressure exposure to the because even in spontaneous we will be giving some pressure support ventilation so that may again uh, increase the uh, i mean bronchopleural fistula may not uh, close up so ecmo yes definitely it can be done the next question is from dr priya any comments on obesity link with the poor outcomes during your treatment series so is the obesity is a risk factor yeah dr arun you can go ahead uh obesity is definitely a risk factor because a lot of these patients uh the couple of them which we've had we're not able to prone them com comfortably so they tend to get worse in uh, with a normal ventilation strategy so yes some of them have they've gone on it but uh, the outcome again depends on a lot of other things rather than just the obesity how bad their lung is and uh, what else is happening with the patient yeah i do agree with dr arun because in fact there is something called obesity paradoxes so this because we had quite a number of patients who are beyond 100 kg but still they have come out of uh, ecmo one of the reason is i think uh, their nutritional status will be better as compared to people with who are of lesser weight so anyhow uh, it's a risk factor but uh, it's not a contraindication for ecmo or still you can have a better outcome the next question is about the quality of life post uh, discharge from uh, dr richa dr vivek would like to comment on that uh those patients whom we have discharged uh most of the patient we had discharged with uh, few liter of oxygen say 2 liter 3 liter or 4 liter and uh, what we saw uh, on follow up that uh, within 4 to 6 week the oxygen was stopped completely they had a good saturation on room air and uh, their hrct uh, repeat hrct after a month or when it half month has shown significant improvement and most of them have uh, went for their routine activity within two months so there is no issue once the patient has recovered there is no issue about the functionality or other issues yeah i agree with the dr vivek again it depends upon the extent of lung damage some patients do recover there may be some residual uh, fibrosis probably over a period of time they will get back to their uh, uh, regular lifestyle the next uh, i think uh, very important aspect is uh, developing hypoxia on vv ecmo so dr arpan would like to how often you see hypoxia on ecmo and what saturation you will accept and what are the things uh, you try when there is a low saturation so hypoxia in vv ecmo is uh, uh, quite common uh, uh, in this covid era because one thing uh, obviously if you exclude uh, the recirculation uh, uh, the other thing is the uh, your bad lung your lung is not contributing anything and if you are septic if you are febrile if you are if your uh, basic metabolic rate is higher uh, all this time where your, uh, general, your own cardiac output is higher and you are not able to give adequate flow that percentage of the 60% 70% requirement of vv flow actually doesn't happen so that causes hypoxia and third is the that profound vq mismatch when the patient even on ecmo when they cough when they become agitated when they become uh, try to speak something they got uh, desaturated even on ecmo it happens 
so this is a very common thing and uh, though it is not related with your ecmo winning and all this but people do uh, get fearful that what is happening uh, suddenly on ecmo the saturation uh, when it cuffs the saturation come down to 65 and then sudden, uh, slowly it comes up so it is very common and all this if we take those things out the regular causes like if you have this uh, oxygenator issues if you have this recirculation this cannulary positioning and all these things these are the things but most commonly what we have found that refractory hypoxias uh, if you exclude those uh, mechanical issues and troubleshootings that is because of your bad lung is not improving and that's where actually we landed up doing proning on ECMO if uh, I, some kind of um, this lungs contribution to oxygenation increases and that actually helped us. So these are the things and third is the uh, second thing what we have started doing is the bronchoscopy, regular bronchoscopies. I, I think everybody is doing now regular bronchoscopies. One patient may require six to seven times of bronchoscopy, repeated secretions, uh, pulling out, uh, uh, closing the bronchus bleeding inside, everything, uh, if you can clean them with bronchoscopies, they also increase your uh, saturations with the bad lung. So just uh, just to uh, summarize, if you categorize those troubleshootings, like uh, if you exclude recirculation initially, uh, the uh, oxygenator malfunction or your agitated patient and all these things, the bad lung contributes your low saturation most of the time. So we have to take care of that. Yeah, I think uh, one of the important uh, thing is to prevent recirculation. So you need to look at the cannula tips. The distance should be at least uh, eight centimeter. If if the cannula is too much into the RA drainage cannula, and also your return cannula is in the RA, and if the distance is less, uh, there is likelihood of uh, recirculation. So doc, as uh, Dr. Arpan rightly pointed out, you need to keep a minimum distance of eight centimeter. The other thing is uh, in, unless, uh, unlike uh, VA ECMO, VB ECMO, you can't expect 100% saturation, especially when the lungs are not uh, working. Usually we'll accept anywhere between 85 to 90 saturation if the lactates are okay and there is no acidosis we can accept that uh, saturation. If it is still low, probably we can increase the hematocrit. Of course, you have to optimize the ventilatory parameters, but if the lung is not contributing at all, we don't have any other option but to increase the ECMO flow, increase the volume status, increase the hemoglobin so that the oxygen carrying capacity oxygenation will be better. See, the next uh, challenging question, I think I will ask uh, Dr. Morley. When do you think oxygenator is not functioning and uh, what are your criteria to change the oxygenator? You have already mentioned changing the oxygenator is really challenging, especially when the lungs are not working. But uh, what makes you change the oxygenator? How often you change? <laughs> Uh, so that we look at multiple factors, uh, the factors what we look from ECMO point of view and second is from patient point of view. From ECMO, from let us first look at patient point of view. From the patient point of view, if your patient is recovering and you are in a situation that where you will be able to take off ECMO very shortly, even if the oxygenator is having some issues, you try to keep a higher threshold to change it. You try to see whether you can drag it till the patient is doing fine. On the contrary, if the patient is having very bad lungs and is critically dependent on ECMO or you are expecting that he takes a longer time to recover, that's where you think of uh, changing the oxygenator. Changing oxygenator from the oxygenator point of view, we keep a continuous monitor on the delta P, that is the transmembrane pressure. Along with that, look at visible clots, how are they? Then you look at the post-membrane gas. Post-membrane gas, uh, even if you are on a blender, you, even you are in a weaning mode, when you have to take a decision that you are going to take off, uh, change the oxygenator, you have to put on 100% oxygen properly directly because blenders are prone for errors and do a post-membrane gas properly and see uh, if it is less than 100 or 150. If you are having hypoxia secondary to the issue with the oxygenator or you're having a high delta P or there is a significant leak or you see that uh, there are a lot of clots and uh, the patient is having a tendency or problems because of that, that's where you think of changing the oxygenator in this patient. Uh, by far delta P of more than 50 or associated with, or 
or if there is a situation associated with hemolysis, patient is having hematuria, having high LDH, your plasma-free hemoglobin is high, and you think the source of clots and the source of the, the all these things is a thrombus which is present either in the circuit or in the oxygenator, that is where it will cause changes. Yeah, I think uh, if there is uh, desaturation and if you are uh, post-oxygenation, saturation is, uh, I mean, post-oxygenator, PAO2s are less than 150 or 100. I think uh, if the delta P is higher than 20, probably that is the time to change. Uh, now, Dr. Professor Vijayanand would like to ask, what is the incidence of mortality during ECMO treatment in Indian perspective? Yeah, I think uh, there are few centers in India who are doing large uh, volume of ECMOs. Uh, to begin with, it was around 30 to 40 percent of the survival. Of late, uh, we are having a good uh, survival rate. Of course, this is only if the lung is totally recovering. If the lung is not recovering, so then the option is only transplant. So probably we have done around 10 transplants for lung transplants, but it is not easy to get the lung in such a situation. Uh, other thing is uh, how long you can keep the patient on ECMO, yeah. See, usually one month, you can keep them uh, safely without much uh, complications. But beyond that, you see oh, so many complications. There may be GI bleed, they may have retroperitoneal hematoma, or they can have uh, thrombocytopenia, multiple clots, cerebral bleed, all complications can happen. However, there are people who have kept the patient on ECMO more than six months also. So there is, uh, as long as the ECMO is working, probably you can keep it. And um, Dr. Deepak, uh, is there any criteria for weaning COVID patient from ECMO who hasn't undergone a lung transplantation? Murli would like to speak about it, talk about it. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, weaning for weaning BVECMO, what we classically say or look at is always a continuous process right from the time you put on ECMO and you stabilize a patient on ECMO. What typically is you once you put on ECMO, once you stabilize him after a day or tender from the oxygenator uh, and uh, target a saturation of around 90 may maximum of 90 saturation decreasing your ECMO support as I have shown the way of weaning you start your ECMO support either by decreasing your flow slowly or you weaning your oxygen support from the blender from 100 you start coming down as the patient is tolerating in the meantime whatever the measures you have done either the proning or mobilization of the patient or if there's a super added bacterial handling the bacterial infection or the general process the inflammation comes down and the lung starts recovering you keep progressively coming down uh, by the time you're in a position to take off the ECMO what we typically is have an FIO2 requirement of less than 60 from the ventilator uh, make sure that the patient is having a, I mean, you don't look at CO2 as a stringent measure, but if, as long as the pH is compensated, you'll accept that. You put off your speed gas flow and uh, you decrease your ECMO flows to minimal. Uh, watch for a few hours. Typically, we like to watch for one day. If the patient is tolerating well, then you plan decannulation and get it out. Yeah. Other questions, I think, uh, Dr. Abhijit, can you eliminate cytopine uh, filter by ECMO? Yes, we can connect a cytosorb or auxiliary filter to the ECMO circuit, it can be done. And a patient with ICD, uh, can you shift them, airlift them? Yes, again, Murli would like to comment on that. Uh, that, that that's a very important point when you're looking at airlifting the patient, uh, once we go to high altitude, all this uh, air and the spaces will expand. Even if the patient has a mild pneumothorax, once we go to high altitude, it's bound to become more and it is bound to trouble. So if you are dealing at a patient before airlifting, we have to look at uh, two, three things from the pneumothorax perspective. Even if there is a slightest doubt, best is to put a tube, keep a watch on that, and then you shift him. That is the first best thing. Even if the patient doesn't require a chest tube, it is safe not to remove it. It is safe to keep it there. Airlift the patient. Once you come to your center, then you watch him and then 
get it out. And in the worst situation, if you have a crisis of networking or if you feel there is an issue, best is to generate saturation with the ECMO and to tide over. Uh, pneumothorax is bound to increase when we are in the mid air. So we have to be very watchful of that and plan it accordingly. Yeah, I think uh, other important thing uh, on ECMO is critical illness neuropathy. So how will you prevent, how will you manage? I think uh, Dr. Arun would like to uh, answer that question. Critical illness, neuropathy, muscle paralysis, and... Uh, I, I think uh, same principles for any uh, ICU-related uh, critical illness neuropathy apply. Mobilize minim minimum amount of uh, muscle, uh, muscle relaxants, stop sedation as early as possible, mobilize as early as possible, and uh, passive physiotherapy to start with, and as and when possible, start giving them active physiotherapy. We've mobilized patients on ECMO, we've got them out on a chair, we've got them standing, we've, you can give them uh, these uh, bicycle pedals to start using their legs on. So I think basically whatever works for a normal ICU patient, you follow the same kind of principle to try and reduce the peripheral neuropathy and myopathies. Yeah, I think uh, that's very important aspects of ECMO management because we do get some patients uh, on ECMO after 30 days, they will have severe critical illness neuropathy. Even though they are candidate for lung transplant, they will take longer time to recover. So it's very important not not to paralyze. Maybe first 24 to 48 hours, you may have to paralyze the patients, deeply sedate the patient. But after that, it's better to avoid uh, muscle paralysis. I think that is very important. The next uh, important question is about the thrombocytopenia and how often you see, how will you manage, Dr. Arpan? Thrombocytopenia is a real concern because uh, it's very much uh, almost all patients of uh, ECMO running more than seven to 10 days on COVID uh, suffer some amount of thrombocytopenia. But uh, we have kept our threshold to accept around 50,000 and probably we will come down further to 40,000 because a lot of uh, 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 patients have uh, thrombocytopenia without bleeding. So uh, we were kept on transfusing the patients. And later on, it has been found that thrombocytopenia is due to uh, maybe these ECMO uh, uh, inter uh, these, uh, interactions, ECMO and uh, blood interactions. It can be due to uh, your oxygenator is, uh, uh, there are some problem in the oxygenator, which is ha having these thrombocytopenic issues. It can be a sepsis. It can be uh, the COVID itself can cause the this is uh, your uh, myelodepression. So there are a lot of them. As I said, there are some heat issues, which is not very common. Uh, I have not found any case of heat issues. But commonly, we have found this uh, associated sepsis is the worst part. But when there is a sepsis, there is a sudden decrease in uh, thrombocytes uh, from uh, these uh, platelets from like 1 lakh to 30,000. This will happen in sepsis. But in kind of this uh, ECMO blood interaction, it uh, decreases very slowly. So uh, there are kind of, uh, things it has to be um, uh, this categorized like this. But the transfusion threshold for uh, uh, thrombocytes, uh, this uh, platelet has to be taken very uh, 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 in a very clear uh, way because uh, uh, with 50,000 cutoff, even I am transfusing a lot of platelets without any bleeding. So I'm just trying to come down it to 40,000. My target is to go to 30,000 so that, because in this pandemic to get SDP for each patient uh, for a long, uh, uh, long drawn ECMO runs, which is the hallmark of a COVID ECMO, it's very, uh, not a very easy job. So it's difficult. So uh, thrombocytopenia is a real concern. And even uh, during tracheostomies, during bronchoscopy, this can uh, lead to some catastrophes. So it's a, it's a problem. Yeah, how often you change heparin to other anticoagulants? Uh, sir, uh, I stop heparin, uh, stop heparin when it comes down to less than 50,000. I don't give heparin. A uh, lot of patients are running heparin-free ECMO now uh, uh, from 14-day uh, onwards. 
and from longer ECMOs, if I can remember, if my 37 days of ECMO, 48 days of ECMO, my 31 days of ECMO, probably last 10, 15 days, they have ran uh, on a platelet count of 45 to 50,000 without any heparin. And uh, uh, oxygenator was fine. It has not, uh, and flow was around uh, more than four liter. So it has happened like that. So I have not given heparin if the uh, this platelet count is below, uh, coming down to below 70,000, I'm not giving heparin. Have you, how, how long it will take for the hit antibodies to be done? Are you getting the... Oh, it, it, it is taking long. That's why uh, uh, I have said and it, it takes uh, at least 72 hours to come uh, for the report. So, and uh, heat, heat, as far as we have seen the heat, the major heat is uh, uh, people don't survive. Uh, there are a lot of clots everywhere and all this. What I found, there is a lot of hypofibrinogenemia. Initially, there is hyperfibrinogenemia. After that, there is hypofibrinogenemia. That indicates also some if you have some uh, these oxygenated issues. So that is a, a consumptive coagulopathy, circuit DICs. These are the main causes where these platelets and fibrinogen also being eaten up by your uh, oxygenator and all this. So you have to differentiate for what your, uh, for which cause your platelet is coming down, your uh, procoagulants are coming down. So that is the thing. But uh, heparin-free ECMO, uh, probably uh, uh, all of us we run uh, for uh, the latter part of the thing with the, this borderline platelet and uh, uh, accepted coagulopathies. Yeah, I think last question probably meaning of ECMO. So Dr. Arun, so what are your criteria to win off the ECMO? When do you decide to win off the ECMO and what way you manage the ECMO and ventilation? COVID ECMO and weaning, I would uh, give it on to Murli or somebody or you, because I, I don't think I'm qualified to talk on that many of COVID ECMOs. Yeah, Murli, I think we have done uh, quite a bit of uh, ECMO to recovery. So Murli is the right person to talk about it. So, uh, thank you, sir. Uh, the weaning on a VV ECMO is almost a continuous process. Uh, as I said before, once you put, once you stabilize them, uh, maybe a day or two, then you start looking at the blood gases. In the meantime, you start doing all your measures to do to make the lungs better, whether that is uh, start pruning the patient or mobilize them. You uh, see whether they require a bronchoscope or handle the secondary infections if they're there or just handle the cytokine storm part of it. Once all this is settled, as they keep getting better, you keep a target saturation of 90 to 95 and start coming down on the when ECMO support, I mean ECMO FIO2. And uh, once they come down less than that, if possible, decrease the flows. And once you come down if, uh, of less than 21%, uh, then you uh, see whether you can test clamp and see. Your monitoring of the patient essentially includes all the parameters. How is it clinically doing? How are the ventilator parameters? How is the compliance? How is the gas exchange? Uh, when your uh, uh, oxygen requirement for the ventilator is less than 60 and you're able to maintain a SATS of 90 to 95, you start comfortably coming down on the uh, ECMO FIO2 component. And in between, you do CTs and see whether there's a radiological improvement or any other factors that are affecting the patient. Yeah, usually, yeah, then once the patient is ready, we don't take off the ECMO. We will uh, stop the gas flow, oxygen flow, and we run the ECMO with uh, two to three liters for 24 to 48 hours. Then uh, uh, we'll take out the ECMO. I think uh, we are almost uh, done because we are running out of time. Dr. Naveen, you would like to say something? Your mic is muted. Yeah. Thank you all the esteemed faculty uh, for joining us today. I reiterate that uh, we had principally decided that in this second surge where we are facing extreme uh, large number of patients in a very short span of time, we will be restricting the webinar activities. But this was required. There were inputs that a uh, uh, lot number of patients will be requiring ECMO. And I am thankful to all of you, all the anesthesiologists who are doing active work in ICMO in joining us today uh, on this uh, webinar. Uh, I thank the coordinator, Dr. Arpan Chakravarti, who is also a member of 
uh, ISA National Task Force on COVID clinical coordinators. And I have been listening to him uh, about his ICMO work. So I gave him this idea, okay, please uh, ensure that we have a webinar. And so uh, excellent faculty, uh, Dr. Uh, Vivek Gupta, uh, Dr. Uh, Murli Krishna, and Dr. V. Arun, and uh, very nicely moderated uh, by Dr. Suresh Rao, sir. And uh, the deliberations were good, the discussions were good. And I'm very sure uh, that the centers who are procuring ICMO machines or are being donated by the government, they will put these uh, machines to use uh, for the uh, COVID patients and they will be definitely benefited by today's webinar. I once again pray to God that this uh, pandemic is over soon. All of you, your family members and friends remain healthy and survive the pandemic. Thank you very much. Long live ISA, Jai IACN, Jai Hind. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.